आप नाम से ही यहाँ पर पता लग सकते हैं लगा सकते हैं कि इट इज एक्चुअली ग्रुप ऑफ ट्वेंटी तो ये ट्वेंटी क्या है दे ट्वेंटी आर डिफरेंट नेशन अक्रॉस वर्ल्ड तो ये दरअसल एक इंटर गवर्नमेंटल फॉरम है हम कई इस तरीके से फॉरम और प्लेटफॉर्म के बारे में बात करते हैं तो वन सच प्लेटफॉर्म और फॉरम इज एक्चुअली जी ट्वेंटी यहाँ पर नाइनटीन अलग अलग कंट्रीज और एक यूरोपियन यूनियन जो है वो पार्टिसिपेट करते हैं डिस्कशन और डिबेट वहां पर करते हैं तो सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट जो मेजर इश्यूज हमें जी ट्वेंटी में इस इंटर गवर्नमेंटल फॉरम में जो देखने को मिलते हैं वो ग्लोबल इकोनॉमी से रिलेटेड होते हैं ज्यादातर जो कि इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी से डील करते हैं क्लाइमेट क्लाइमेट चेंज और उससे रिलेटेड जो भी इंपॉर्टेंट से चीजें हैं उनके बारे में डिस्कशन करते हैं और सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट का कॉन्सेप्ट जो कि हाल ही में बहुत ही प्रोमिनेंस ले चुका है तो सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट के कॉन्सेप्ट पर यहां पर डिस्कशन किए जाते हैं और जो इंपॉर्टेंट से डिसीजन भी लिए जाते हैं आगे उनके बारे में पढ़ेंगे तो सबसे पहले जानने की कोशिश करते हैं कि दरअसल ये ग्रुपिंग की जरूरत क्या पड़ गई थी हम कई रीजनल ग्रुपिंग्स की भी बातें करते हैं हम कई इंटरनेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशंस की भी बात करते हैं तो जी ट्वेंटी की जरूरत हमें कब महसूस हुई तो जैसे कि हम सभी को पता है कि वर्ल्ड वॉर वन और टू ने हमारे वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमी को इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल सिस्टम को बहुत बुरी तरीके से मार दी हुई थी और यूरोपियन कंट्रीज जो कि आज हेवी इंडस्ट्रियलाइज देखे जाते हैं और द टाइम ऑफ वर्ल्ड वॉर टू बहुत ही नीगर हो चुके थे बहुत ही मजबूत थे बहुत ही वीक थे तो ऐसी जरूरत हमें महसूस हो रही थी कि हमें एक वर्ल्ड क्लास इंस्टीट्यूशन बनाने की जरूरत थी हमें चंद ऐसे इनिशियटिव लेने की जरूरत थी जो कि इंटरनेशनल लेवल पर हमारे फाइनेंशियल सिस्टम को सही तौर पर मेंटेन कर सके कोऑर्डिनेशन हमारी इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसी से रिलेटेड सही हो सके और उससे रिलेटेड सबसे मेजर डिसीजन हम ऑलरेडी देखते हैं विच इज ब्रिटेन वुड कॉन्फ्रेंस जो लंच हुआ था नाइनटीन फोर्टी में जिसके रिजल्ट के सब हम इंटरनेशनल मॉनिटरी फंड और वर्ल्ड बैंक जैसे इंस्टीट्यूशन का एस्टेब्लिशमेंट देखते हैं तो ऑन द सेम लाइन महज वर्ल्ड बैंक और इंटरनेशनल मॉनिटरी फंड के स्टेब्लिशमेंट होना काफी नहीं था इस तरीके के और भी कई वर्ल्ड क्लास इंस्टीट्यूशन और इनिशियटिव हमारे लिए बहुत ही जरूरी थे तो उसी सच नीड में से बाहर आया हुआ एक कॉन्सेप्ट था द ग्रुपिंग ऑफ ट्वेंटी इज जी ट्वेंटी तो जी सेवन जो थे वो नेशंस ऑलरेडी जो वन ऑफ द मोस्ट डेवलप्ड जो नेशंस थे 1970s में उन्होंने उनकी बैठक हुई थी और जी सेवन वहां से हमें स्टैब्लिश होता हुआ देखते हैं देखने को मिलते हैं मैं आपको आगे भी इसके बारे में थोड़ा बहुत बताऊंगा तो जी सेवन के इनिशिएटिव से जो है सबसे पहली बार हमें जी का कॉन्सेप्ट देखने को मिलता है खासकर ग्लोबल फाइनेंशियल क्राइसिस जब हो रहे थे नाइनटीन में और एशियन इकोनॉमी जो थे वहां पर थोड़ा बहुत अच्छा खासा डेवलपमेंट दिखा रहे थे तो यहाँ पर जी सेवन को पता चल गया कि अगर हमें इकोनॉमिक वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमिक ऑर्डर को सही तौर पर मेंटेन करना है हमारे फाइनेंशियल सिस्टम्स को अगर हमें सही तौर पर मेंटेन करना है तो हमें जस्ट डेवलप्ड नेशंस नहीं हमें डेवलपिंग और अंडर डेवलप्ड नेशंस को भी साथ लेकर चलना है क्योंकि उस टाइम फ्रेम में एशियन कंट्रीज जो खासकर इंडिया ब्राजील इस तरीके के जो इवन साउथ अमेरिकन नेशंस भी जो थे वो बहुत ही प्रोमिनेंस दिखा रहे थे वो डेवलपमेंट में बहुत ही आगे जा रहे थे तो इस तरीके के नए नए मार्केट को भी साथ लेकर चलना बहुत ही जरूरी था उन्हें इंपॉर्टेंस पता चल गया कि इस तरीके के जो नेशन थे वो बहुत ही क्रोशियल हो सकते सो दिस एक्चुअली पेड फॉर द फॉर्मल स्टेब्लिशमेंट ऑफ जी ट्वेंटी ग्रुपिंग तो वहां पर कैरेडियन फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर पॉल मार्टिन साहब जो थे वो सबसे पहली बार चेयरमैन की तरह चूज किए गए थे फॉर दैट इनोग्रल सेशन लेकिन यहां पर एक खास बात ये थी कि 1999 में जी ट्वेंटी का आइडिया जो है पूरी तरीके से आता है उसका एस्टेब्लिशमेंट भी होता है लेकिन वो बहुत ही इनरेगुलर था यानी कि उसे पूरी तरीके से एक स्ट्रक्चरल और इंस्टीट्यूशनल फॉर्म उसे नहीं दिया गया था तो सबसे दूसरा मेजर जो डिसीजन आता है एज फार एज एस्टेब्लिशमेंट ऑफ जी ट्वेंटी वो दो में आता है आप सभी को पता है दो में पूरी दुनिया ग्लोबल फाइनेंशियल क्राइसिस से गुजर रही थी और खासकर यूएस जैसी कंट्री भी बहुत ही मजबूर थी इस फाइनेंशियल क्राइसिस से गुजरने के लिए तो एट दट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम वर्ल्ड लीडर्स को फिर से पता चल गया कि नहीं और खासकर जी ट्वेंटी लीडर्स को के वी आर द नेक्स्ट बिग थिंग इन दिस इकोनॉमी इन दिस मार्केट तो जाहिर सी बात है हमें साथ लेकर चलना पड़ेगा हमें कंसेंसस बिल्ड करके ही और हाईएस्ट पॉलिटिकल लेवल पर जब तक हम डिसीजन नहीं लेंगे हम एक इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल ऑर्डर को सस्टेन और सर्वाइव नहीं कर सकते तो यही वो मेजर डिसीजन था दो में जहां पर जी ट्वेंटी लीडर्स ने एक यूनाइट डिसीजन लिया हुआ था ठान लिया हुआ था कि वो हर साल एनुअली मीट करेंगे इन समिट्स पे तो इन ऑर्डर टू प्रिपेयर फॉर दिस समिट्स द जी ट्वेंटी फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर्स एंड सेंट्रल बैंक गवर्नर्स कंटिन्यू टू मीट ऑन देयर ओन ट्वाइस अयर तो हर साल जो हाइएस्ट पॉलिटिकल लीडर्स होते हैं कंट्रीज के लिए अगर किसी कंट्री में प्राइम मिनिस्टर है और किसी कंट्री में प्रेसिडेंट्स तो वहां पर ईयरली एक समिट होता है मैं उस वो समिट्स किस तरीके से होते हैं उसके बारे में बताऊंगा तो सेपरेटली अपार्ट फ्रॉम दो इंपॉर्टेंट समिट्स हर साल जो है दो बार फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर्स और सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट सेंट्रल बैंक के गवर्नर्स और उन रिस्पेक्टिव कंट्रीज के वो मिलते हैं एजेंडाज वगैरह वो डिस्कस करते हैं तो यहाँ पर अगर आप देखेंगे होलिस्टिकली आपको थोड़ा बहु
सो लीडर जी ट्वेंटी मेंबर्स तो यूरोपियन यूनियन का भी रिप्रेजेंटेशन हमें यहाँ पर मिलने देखने को मिलता है इसीलिए 19 कंट्रीज प्लस वन यूरोपियन यूनियन इन सभी को जी ट्वेंटी का ग्रुपिंग कहा जाता है तो देर आर फ्यू परमानेंट गेस्ट इन्वाइटीज भी जिन्हें रेगुलरली इसके समय में बुलाया जाता है क्योंकि यहाँ पर भी रिप्रेजेंटेशन बहुत ही जरूरी है तो यहाँ पर आप देख सकते हैं अफ्रीकन यूनियन एशिया वन ऑफ द मोस्ट क्रूशल वन अगेन साउथ ईस्ट एशिया में तो उन्हें भी यहाँ पर एज ए परमानेंट गेस्ट इन्वाइटी बुलाया जाता है फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी बोर्ड फूड एंड एग्रीकल्चर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन आई एल ओ आई एम एफ और खासकर स्पेन की खास बात है स्पेन एक लौता ऐसा कंट्री है जो परमानेंट गेस्ट इन्वाइटी की तरह जी ट्वेंटी के समिट्स को हाजिर होता है वहां पर रिप्रेजेंटेशन देता है तो बाकी के भी आप देख सकते हैं न्यू पार्टनरशिप फॉर अफ्रीकन डेवलपमेंट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन फॉर इकोनॉमिक कोऑपरेशन एंड डेवलपमेंट यूनाइटेड नेशन वर्ल्ड बैंक ग्रुप डब्ल्यू एच ओ और वर्ल्ड ट्रेड ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को भी यहाँ पर परमानेंट गेस्ट इन्वाइटीज की तरह बुलाया जाता है तो यहाँ पर आप देख सकते हैं कि कितना क्रूशियल जी ट्वेंटी एक फॉर्मल या फिर जी ट्वेंटी ये इंटर गवर्नमेंटल फॉरम है इसका सिग्निफिकेंस क्या है अच्छी बात है सर तो हमें इस तरीके के क्या बाकी के भी कंट्रीज या फिर इस तरीके के ग्रुपिंग्स नहीं है क्या एशियान भी है साउथ के भी बारे में हमने बात किया ऐसे कई हैं तो इसका सिग्निफिकेंस क्या है जी ट्वेंटी किस लिए एक प्रोमिनेंट प्लेस रखता है तो जी ट्वेंटी बहुत ही स्ट्रेटेजिक रोल प्ले करता है खासकर हमारे ग्लोबल इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ और प्रोस्पेरिटी को इंश्योर करने में सिक्योर हमारे फ्यूचर बनाने में खासकर एज फार एज आर इकोनॉमिक स्ट्रेंथ इज कंसर्ट क्योंकि यहाँ पर आप आंकड़े अगर देखें तो जी ट्वेंटी मेंबर्स जो जितने भी नाइनटीन कंट्रीज प्लस वन यूरोपियन यूनियन है वो सभी मिलाकर सिक्सटी ऑफ द वर्ल्ड पॉपुलेशन को रिप्रेजेंट करते हैं 80 परसेंट ऑफ द ग्लोबल जीडीपी को रिप्रेजेंट करते हैं और 75 परसेंट ऑफ ग्लोबल एक्सपोर्ट्स को वो एक लोते एक रिप्रेजेंट करते हैं तो आप देख सकते हैं कि किस लिए जी ट्वेंटी ग्रुपिंग इतना सिग्निफिकेंट है और पूरी दुनिया जो है वो रुकती है देखने के लिए कि जी ट्वेंटी का मीटिंग क्या चल रहा है और वहां पर आउटकम क्या था एजेंडा क्या था डिस्कशन क्या थे क्योंकि वर्चुअली टू थर्ड्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड का कहीं ना कहीं हम देख सकते हैं इंपॉर्टेंट जो पॉपुलेशन का रिप्रेजेंटेशन हो ग्लोबल जीडीपी का हो या फिर ग्लोबल एक्सपोर्ट्स का हो वो हमें इन जी ट्वेंटी नेशन से ही देखने को मिलता है और जी ट्वेंटी काम किस तरीके से करता है प्रेसिडेंसी जो है वो हर साल रोटेट होती है अमंग ऑल द मेंबर्स तो 19 जो कंट्रीज हैं और यूरोपियन यूनियन जो है उनके बीच ये प्रेसिडेंसी हम प्रेसिडेंट प्रेसिडेंसी जो है वो इवॉल्व होती ही रहती है और खासकर यहां पर आपको एक टर्म जाना बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है दट इज ट्रॉइका ट्रॉइका विद कंट्री दट होल्ड द प्रेसिडेंसी वर्किंग टूगेदर विद इट्स प्रेस एंड सक्सेसर आर ऑल्सो नोन एज अ ट्रॉइका टू एंश्योर द कंटिन्यूटी ऑफ द एजेंडा तो हर तीन साल के लिए जो है ऑलरेडी मेंबर्स को चूज किया जाता है अलग अलग ग्रुपिंग्स होते हैं आपको उसके बारे में भी बताऊंगा तो इस ट्रॉइका को जो है वो मिलाकर तीन साल के प्रेसिडेंसी प्रेसिडेंसी दिए जाते हैं अब मान लेते हैं कि करेंटली इटली जिसने पिछले साल की जी ट्वेंटी समिट को होस्ट किया हुआ था 2021 अभी करेंटली 2022 इंडोनेशिया बाली में हो रहा है और 2023 इंडिया न्यू दिल्ली में जो है ये होस्ट होगा तो इन तीन कंट्रीज को मिलाकर ट्रॉइका कहा जाता है तो एजेंडा जो जी ट्वेंटी इटली में सेट करता है वो इंडोनेशिया और इंडिया में भी कंटिन्यू होता है तो बाद इनके अगेन तीन ट्रॉइका को चूज किया जाता है जो कि फर्दर आगे नेक्स्ट तीन साल के लिए प्रेसिडेंसी होल्ड करेंगे और इंपॉर्टेंट से एजेंडा डिस्कस करेंगे और जी ट्वेंटी का कोई भी परमानेंट सेक्रेटेरियट नहीं है हम साथ की बात करते हैं एशियान की बात करते हैं इन सभी के हेडक्वार्टर्स कहीं ना कहीं होते हैं सेक्रेटेरियट होते हैं यहां पर परमानेंट सेक्रेटेरियट नहीं होता इसीलिए इसे बहुत ही यूनिक और डायनामिक माना जाता है कि जिस कंट्री में जो डिस्कशन होता है पर जिस कंट्री में होस्ट किया हुआ होता है वहां पर नया सा सेक्रेटेरियट बनाया जाता है क्योंकि जहां पर वो एजेंडा जो डिस्कशन किए गए हैं वो उसी कंट्री से ही इनिशिएट किए जाते हैं और वहीं से दे मेक श्योर दट दे ऑल और फुलफिल्ड एजेंडा एंड द वर्क कोऑर्डिनेशन इज कम्प्लीटली बन दैट जी ट्वेंटी लीडर्स पर्सनल रिप्रेजेंटेटिव नोन एज शेरबास तो हर कंट्री अपने अपने रिप्रेजेंटेटिव को भेजती है चूज करके तो इंडिया ने अपने शेरपा को जो है पीयूष गोयल साहब को चुनकर भेजा हुआ था एंड टूगेदर विद फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर एंड सेंट्रल बैंक गवर्नेंस तो ये तीनों पोजिशन बहुत ही क्रूशियल है रिमेम्बर एक तो शेरपा जो कि रिप्रेजेंट करते हैं उस कंट्री को ठीक है वहां पर पर्सनल रिप्रेजेंटेटिव उस जी ट्वेंटी लीडर्स के मान लेते हैं कि इंडिया इंडिया में तो प्राइम मिनिस्टर नरेंद्र मोदी जी है तो उन्होंने अपना रिप्रेजेंट देने के लिए कहीं ना कहीं पीयूष गोयल साहब को भेजा हुआ है एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम दट फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर निर्मला सीतारमन जी और सेंट्रल बैंक गवर्नर हमारे यहाँ तो आरबीआई है सेंट्रल बैंक तो शक्तिकांत दास साहब तो इनके तीनों बहुत ही क्रूशल होते हैं इस जी ट्वेंटी के वर्क से लिए तो इसी तरीके से 19 कंट्रीज और यूरोपियन यूनियन भी अपने इस तरीके के रिप्रेजेंटेशंस भेजता है और प्रेसिडेंसी का सिलेक्शन कैसा होता है अभी हमने देखा अच्छी बात है ट्रॉइका है हर तीन साल एजेंडा चेंज होते हैं और कंटिन्यूटी के लिए भी अच्छी बात है लेकिन सिलेक्ट किस तरीके से होते हैं तो 19 कंट्रीज जो पूरे हैं ना उन सभी को पांच अलग अलग ग्रुपिंग्स में डिवाइड किया गया है ऑफ कोर्स यूरोपियन यूनियन जो है वो रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ सेपरेट कंट्रीज है तो उसे किसी ग्रुपिंग में नहीं रख
तो अब तक जो है जो जितने भी इंपोर्टेंट से जी ट्वेंटी समिट्स है उन सभी के बारे में थोड़ा बहुत देखते हैं तो सबसे पहले जैसे कि आप सभी को पता है वॉशिंगटन डीसी में हुआ था यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स ऑफ अमेरिका फॉलोड बाई यूके लंडन एंड देन थर्ड समिट जो था वो अगेन यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स पिट्सबर्ग में हुआ था फोर्थ कैनेडा टोरंटो में हुआ था फिफ्थ समिट जो था वो साउथ कोरिया सियोन में हुआ था सिक्स फ्रांस कैनिस सेवंथ मेक्सिको में था और एट्थ रशिया सेंट पीटर्सबर्ग में हुआ था नाइन्थ ऑस्ट्रेलिया ब्रिस्बेन टेंथ टर्की में हुआ था और इलेवंथ जो था वो चाइना क्वाइंसो में हुआ था ट्वेल्थ जी ट्वेंटी समिट जर्मनी में था और थर्टींथ जी ट्वेंटी समिट अर्जेंटीना में था फोर्टींथ जापान ओसाका में था फिफ्टींथ सऊदी अरेबिया रियाद में था और सिक्सटींथ इटली रोम में हुआ था हाल ही में ही तो हर जी ट्वेंटी समिट में कहीं ना कहीं कोई ना कोई इंपॉर्टेंट से डिक्लेरेशन और डिसीजन लिए ही गए थे तो बहुत ही क्रुशल है ये सभी समिट्स तो अभी एज ऑफ नो टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू के लिए जो कि सेवेंटींथ समिट चलने वाला है वो इंडोनेशिया होस्ट कर रहा है करेक्टली विच इज इन बाली तो टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री के लिए जो कि इंडिया जो है जिसने होस्टशिप एक्ट की हुई है तो वो मोस्ट ऑफली न्यू दिल्ली में हो सकता है तो इससे रिलेटेड अभी जैसे कि मैंने वीडियो के पहले मैं आपको कहा कि हाल ही में ही कैबिनेट के इंपॉर्टेंट से डिसीजन लिए गए थे कि सेक्रेटेरिएट कहां पर होगा कौन कौन क्या क्या रिस्पॉसिबिलिटीज लेगा वो सभी एलोकेट और असाइन किए गए हैं टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री के लिए और टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर के लिए भी एक्सपेक्टेड है ब्राजिल अभी कुछ फुलफिल कहा नहीं गए क्योंकि जैसे कि मैंने कहा कि ट्राई का यहां पर तीन तीन लोग तीन तीन कंट्रीज जो मिलकर काम करते हैं तो नाइनटीन समिट जो है वो एक्सपेक्टेड टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर ब्राजिल कर सकता है और टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फाइव के लिए साउथ अफ्रीका कर सकता है एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम द लीडर लेवल हाइएस्ट लेवल जो है समिट्स ऑलरेडी हम चलते हैं जहां पर कंट्रीज के प्रेसिडेंट से प्राइम मिनिस्टर जाते हैं अपार्ट फ्रॉम दट मिनिस्ट्रियल लेवल मीटिंग्स भी यहां पर होते हैं तो 1999 में सबसे पहली बार फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर्स एंड सेंट्रल बैंक गवर्नर्स की मीटिंग स्टार्ट हुई थी ऑफकोर्स वो सबसे पहला स्पार्क यहीं से आता है क्योंकि हाइएस्ट पोलिटिकल लेवल मीटिंग्स जो शुरू हुए थे वो दो से हुए थे रेगुलरली तो नाइनटीन से ही फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर्स और सेंट्रल बैंक गवर्नर्स की मीटिंग स्टार्ट हुए थे मिनिस्ट्रियल लेवल मीटिंग्स दो में से और थोड़ा एक्सपेंड करके लेबर और एम्प्लॉयमेंट मिनिस्टर्स के भी मीटिंग्स रखे गए थे जी ट्वेंटी के okay. 2017 में फॉरेन लेवल फॉरेन मिनिस्टर्स लेवल मीटिंग भी रखे गए थे और 2012 से ट्रेड मिनिस्टर्स या फिर कॉमर्स मिनिस्टर जो होते हैं उनसे रिलेटेड भी जी ट्वेंटी मिनिस्ट्री लेवल मीटिंग्स रखे गए थे और सिंस देन कंटिन्यूसली वो चलते ही रहे हैं और सिर्फ इंपॉर्टेंट से डिस्कशन वहां पर भी होते रहे हैं एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम ऑल दीज मिनिस्ट्री लेवल मीटिंग्स एंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम ऑल दीज हाइस्ट पोलिटिकल लेवल मीटिंग्स जी ट्वेंटी एंगेजमेंट ग्रुप्स भी मेंटेन करता है आप यहां पर देख सकते हैं कि बिजनेस ग्रुप्स को बिजनेस इंटरेस्ट ग्रुप्स को रिप्रेजेंट करने के लिए भी जो है वो बी ट्वेंटी ग्रुप बनाया गया था ठीक है दो हजार आठ में से स्टेब्लिश किया गया था और दो हजार दस में से रिकग्नाइजेशन मिला हुआ था तो लेबर से रिलेटेड भी ट्रेड यूनियन और अदर एम्प्लॉज से रिप्रेजेंटेटिव यानी कि यहां पर इन ट्वेंटी कंट्रीज या फिर इन ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन कंट्रीज और यूरोपियन यूनियन के जो रिप्रेजेंटेटिव है बिजनेस के वो वहां पर इंगेजमेंट ग्रुप्स की तरह वहां पर आते हैं सिमिलरली यहां पर भी सेशन और समिट चलते थे आप देख सकते हैं ये ट्वेंटी जो था वो 2008 में फाउंड किया गया था और उसे रिकॉग्नाइजेशन 2011 में मिला था सी ट्वेंटी दट इज सिविल ट्वेंटी सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन जो एनजीओ होते हैं ट्वेंटी कंट्रीज में उनके लिए भी एक फॉरम बनाया गया था या फिर एक एंगेजमेंट ग्रुप जो कि 2013 में इसे रिकॉग्नाइजेशन मिला हुआ था यूथ के रिप्रेजेंटेटिव के लिए भी वही ट्वेंटी एंगेजमेंट ग्रुप बनाया गया था थिंक टैंक जो ग्लोबल थिंक टैंक होते हैं खासकर हमारी जी ट्वेंटी कंट्रीज के उनके लिए भी एक एंगेजमेंट ग्रुप बनाया गया था वुमेन खासकर वुमेन के रिप्रेजेंटेशन के लिए वुमेन राइट्स ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के लिए भी जो है टू में डब्ल्यू एंगेजमेंट ग्रुप एस्टेब्लिश किया गया था यस ट्वेंटी फॉर साइंस एंड रिसर्च रिप्रेजेंटेटिव एंड फाइनली यू ट्वेंटी फॉर अर्बन अर्बन रिप्रेजेंटेशन जो कि मेयर्स और गवर्नर्स होते हैं मेजर अर्बन सिटीज के जी ट्वेंटी में जितने भी मेजर बड़े बड़े अर्बन सिटीज हैं उन सभी के गवर्नर्स और मेयर्स के रिप्रेजेंटेशन के लिए वहां पर एंगेजमेंट के लिए जी ट्वेंटी एंगेजमेंट ग्रुप्स बनाए गए तो आप देख सकते हैं कि किस लिए जी ट्वेंटी इतना सिग्निफिकेंट माना जाता है और फिर हम एक बार देखते रहे कि इसका सिग्निफिकेंस क्या है किस किस तरीके से ये काम करने की कोशिश करता है क्यों ये सबसे हटकर है स्ट्रेंथनिंग फाइनेंशियल रेगुलेशन ऑफ कोर्स 75 परसेंट ग्लोबल एक्सपोर्ट्स हम देख सकते हैं अच्छा खासा जीडीपी का रिप्रेजेंटेशन दुनिया का यहाँ पर देते देखने को हमें मिलता है तो फाइनेंशियल रेगुलेशन रेगुलेशन को ज्यादा से ज्यादा हम स्ट्रेंथन कर सकते हैं इनकी मदद से कोआर्डिनेटेड फिजिकल एंड मॉनिटरी स्टिमुलस मैंने आपको कई बार कहा कि फिजिकल जब बोर्ड आए इट इज रिलेटेड विद फाइनेंस फाइनेंस मिनिस्ट्री और मॉनिटरी जब बोर्ड आए तो इट इज रिलेटेड विद सेंट्रल बैंक और आरबीए तो यहाँ पर आप देख सकते हैं कि कंट्री में इंडिविजुअल कंट्री में भी जो टैंडम होता है जो फिजिकल फाइनेंस मिनिस्ट्री और जो उसकी सेंट्रल बैंक के बीच वो भी कोऑर्डिनेट हो सही तौर पर उसका स्टिमुलस भी आगे बढ़ता रहे क्योंकि यहां पर जो मेजर डिसीजंस लिए जाते हैं वो इंडिविजुअल लेवल पर कंट्र
ऑल द ट्रेड और इकोनॉमिक इन्फ्लेक्स भी बहुत जबरदस्त सा होता है एंड द वन मोर इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज इट इज टू बिग टू फेल अभी हमने जितने भी आंकड़े ऊपर देखे हुए थे 60% परसेंट ऑफ द पॉपुलेशन रिप्रेजेंट करता है इम्पोर्ट्स और एक्सपोर्ट्स के किस तरीके से तो ये बहुत ही बड़ा है फेल होने के लिए यानी कि दैट वेरी यूज इट्सेल्फ इज मोर देन अनफ कि ये रेसिलियंट एक ग्लोबल प्लेटफॉर्म है या फिर एक एक रेसिलियंट इंटर गवर्नमेंटल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है कहने के लिए और जन इंपॉर्टेंट से इश्यूज जो अब तक जी ट्वेंटी ने एड्रेस किए हुए थे फाइनेंशियल मार्केट से रिलेटेड जन इंपॉर्टेंट से डिसीजन लिए गए थे टैक्स और फिजिकल पॉलिसी से रिलेटेड भी इंपॉर्टेंट डिसीजन लिए गए थे ट्रेड एग्रीकल्चर एम्प्लॉयमेंट एनर्जी करप्शन वुमेन एम्पावरमेंट एजेंडा ट्वेंटी थर्टी सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंटल गोल्स जिन्हें हम कहते हैं क्लाइमेट चेंज ग्लोबल हेल्थ और एंटी टेरिज्म पर भी मेजर इश्यूज जो थे उन सभी के बारे में जी ट्वेंटी के अलग अलग समिट्स में हमने डिस्कशन देखे हुए थे और सिंस कोविड तो ग्लोबल हेल्थ तो बहुत ही इंपॉर्टेंट सा रोल प्ले कर रहा है और इंडिया जो कि 2023 का होस्ट होने वाला है तो कौन से कौन से प्रायोरिटी के एरियाज हम देख सकते हैं जो कि इंडिया ने ऑलरेडी डिसाइड किया है यहाँ पर इंडियन पर फोकस जरूर कर सकता है टैक्स एवेशन से रिलेटेड इश्यूज हम हाईलाइट यहाँ पर कर सकते हैं एक कंट्री से दूसरे कंट्रीज में टैक्स एजुकेशन बहुत ही हमें ज्यादा देखने को मिलता है फाइट अगेंस्ट करप्शन करप्शन के खिलाफ भी हम आवाज उठा सकते हैं और तीसरा सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट जो कि हर जगह पर सिंस प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदी जी हेज कम इन्होंने बहुत ही कोशिश की हुई है ग्लोबल प्लेटफॉर्म पर इस इश्यू को लाने की रिस्क टेरर फंडिंग एंड स्टेट स्पॉन्सर टेरिज्म क्योंकि इंडिया खुद प्रॉब्लम फेस कर चुका है इससे तो ये भी हमारे एक अच्छा कॉन्सेप्ट हो सकता है यहां पर हाईलाइट करने के लिए करने के लिए कटिंग द कॉस्ट ऑफ रेमिटेंसेस ऑफ कोर्स वन ऑफ द मोस्ट एंड वन ऑफ द मोस्ट मेजर माइग्रेंट्स जो हमें देखने को मिलता है ऑफ कोर्स ये कहावत भी है कि पूरी दुनिया में आपको हर कोई में कहीं ना कहीं एक चाइनीज और एक इंडियन देखने को मिलेंगे तो जाहिर सी बात है कि ग्लोबल रेमिटेंस से रिलेटेड भी हम थोड़ा बहुत कॉस्ट करवा कट करवा सकते हैं और फार्मास्यूटिकल इंडस्ट्री भी हमारी टैप करने का यहां पर बहुत ही सुनहरा मौका है हमें की ड्रग्स पर हम मार्केट एक्सेस के लिए भी बात कर सकते हैं रिफॉर्म्स इन इंटरनेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन ऑफ कोर्स ये तो एक्टिवली ऑलरेडी चल रहा है लेकिन फिर भी हम ब्रिक्स का भी हिस्सा है तो वहां पर न्यू डेवलपमेंट बैंक हम देख सकते हैं तो इस तरीके से नए 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 बैंकिंग फाइनेंशियल इंस्टीट्यूशन और ऑलरेडी जो इंटरनेशनल इंस्टीट्यूशन चल रहे हैं उन पर भी हम रिफॉर्म्स लाने की बात कर सकते हैं और सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट सी चीज रियल एक्शन ऑन क्लाइमेट चेंज तो जितने भी कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑफ पार्टीज चलते हैं यूएन के वहां पर बड़ी बड़ी प्रोमिस जरूर किए जाते हैं लेकिन रियल एक्शन वहां पर नहीं होता तो इंडिया भी ऑफ कोर्स हाल ही में जो कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑफ पार्टी ट्वेंटी सिक्स ग्लास ग्लो में हुआ था वहां पर प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदी जी ने पांच प्रेक्स दिए हुए थे तो हम इस तरीके के इश्यूज भी वहां पर हाईलाइट कर सकते हैं कि वी डोंट नीड द टॉक वी नीड द वॉक चैलेंजेस क्या क्या है ओवरऑल जी ट्वेंटी ग्रुपिंग में अगर हम बात कर सके नो एनफोर्समेंट मैकेनिज्म बिल्कुल यहां पर हम डिस्कशन तो जरूर चलाते हैं लेकिन उसे एनफोर्स किस तरीके से करेंगे ये मैकेनिज्म हमने अब तक नहीं बनाया जी ट्वेंटी में नॉट लीगली बाइंडिंग आज के जमाने में जितने भी इंपॉर्टेंट ग्रुपिंग इंपॉर्टेंट इंटर गवर्नमेंटल फॉरम प्लेटफॉर्म हम देखते हैं सबसे बड़ा प्रॉब्लम जो वो फेस करते हैं इज एक्चुअली द वॉलेंटरी नेचर ऑफ देयर अग्रीमेंट्स वहां पर अग्रीमेंट्स तो साइन किए जाते हैं बड़ी बड़ी बातें तो वहां पर की जाती है लेकिन वो लीगली बाइंडिंग नहीं होती यानी कि वो रिकमेंडेटरी नेचर पर होती तो ये नहीं होना चाहिए मोस्टली ग्लोबल हेल्थ को सिक्योर करना ऑफ कोर्स पोस्ट कोविड तो सबसे बड़ा हर्डल अगर नॉट जस्ट जी ट्वेंटी दुनिया के आगे अगर कुछ था तो वो ग्लोबल हेल्थ को सिक्योर करना था रिफ्यूलिंग और फ्यूलिंग इकोनॉमिक रिकवरी एंड ऑफ कोर्स पोस्ट कोविड जो कि कंटिन्यूस लॉकडाउन वगैरह पड़ रहे थे तो इकोनॉमिक रिकवरी जैसे कि रिसिलियंट इकोनॉमी की हम बात करते हैं कि जितनी मार उसे बढ़ेगी उतना ही ज्यादा और उतना ही जल्दी वो बाउंस बैक करेगा तो इस तरीके की इकोनॉमिक रिकवरी के बारे में क्या सोचेगा जी डिजिटल रेवल्यूशन की हम बात कर रहे हैं ऑफकोर्स थोड़ा वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज में अच्छी बात है कि वहां पर इंटरनेट कनेक्शन हो या फिर डिजिटल लिटरेसी ज्यादा हो लेकिन जब हम ईस्टर्न हेमिस्फीयर के ज्यादातर जब हम बात करते हैं क्योंकि इस ग्रुपिंग में हम इंडिया सऊदी अरेबिया इस तरीके के कंट्रीज भी देखते हैं तो वहां पर डिजिटल रेवल्यूशन हम कैसे लाएंगे क्लाइमेट चेंज रिस्क सबसे बड़ा है नो अभी हाल ही में भी इंटर गवर्नमेंटल पैनल और क्लाइमेट चेंज के रिपोर्ट भी आए हुए थे तो उससे किस तरीके से डील करेगा ये वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट चैलेंजेस है इसके आगे प्लास्टिक से रिलेटेड भी हम मुहिम चला रहे हैं तो लेटर्स वेट एंड वॉच और ग्लोबल फ्रेमवर्क फॉर टैक्स रिफॉर्म स्पेसिफिकली जो कि अभी हमने देखा कि टैक्स एवेशन जैसी जैसे प्रॉब्लम भी हम फेस कर रहे हैं तो ग्लोबल फ्रेमवर्क की बहुत ही जरूरत है टैक्स रिफॉर्म्स के लिए जो यूनानिमसली ये सभी जी ट्वेंटी कंट्रीज एक्सेप्ट करेंगे और ये लीगली बाइंडिंग होनी चाहिए तो वे अहेड क्या हो सकता है इसका टिल नाउ अगर सच बताएं तो जी ट्वेंटी जी ट्वेंटी में कंपेयर विद अदर रीजनल ग्रुपिंग या फिर अदर इंटर गवर्नमेंटल फॉरम बहुत ही सही ट्रैक पर जा रहा है कंसिस्टेंसी वो मेंटेन कर रहा है क्योंकि बाकी अभी सार के बारे में
पर काम करेगा मोस्टली दिस कैन बी द नेक्स्ट वे अहेड और टेक्नोलॉजिकल इनोवेशन पर थोड़ा बहुत फोकस करेंगे तो बहुत ही अच्छा हो सकता है इंडस्ट्री में इनोवेशन के लिए खासकर जो है पॉलिसीज वो बना सकते हैं और इंटेलेक्चुअल प्रॉपर्टी राइट से रिलेटेड भी चंद इंपॉर्टेंट से डिस्कशन करेंगे तो बहुत ही अच्छा होगा और रीडिफाइन करने की हमें जरूरत है कि रीना क्या क्या होंगे कॉपरेशन के ऑफकोर्स हमने देखा कि अंडर अर्थ जो कुछ भी मिल रहा है वो सभी के बारे में डिस्कस कर रहे हैं हाँ माना कि जी ट्वेंटी एक फाइनेंस रिलेटेड एक टैक्सेशन रिलेटेड इस तरीके से इकोनॉमी से रिलेटेड है लेकिन यहाँ पर क्लाइमेट चेंज की भी हम बात कर रहे हैं यहाँ पर हम ग्लोबल हेल्थ की भी वगैरह की भी बात कर रहे हैं तो रीडिफाइन करने की जरूरत है कि अरिना क्या क्या होंगे कॉपरेशन के और किस तरीके से होंगे और सबसे आखिर में जो सबसे कंसोलिडेटेड एक वे है जो जी ट्वेंटी के लिए जो देखने को मिलता है दट इज लेस टॉक एंड बोर्ड एक्शन रेगुलरली वो मिल जरूर रहे हैं एजेंडा सेट कर रहे हैं रेगुलरली फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर्स वगैरह की भी मीटिंग हो रही है लेकिन एक्शन कितना हुआ है उस पर लीगली बाइंडिंग एग्रीमेंट क्यों नहीं हो रहे हैं तो ये थी चंद बातें आपको जानी थी ग्रुप ऑफ ट्वेंटी या फिर जी ट्वेंटी इंटर इंटर गवर्नमेंटल ग्रुपिंग के बारे में Good evening, everybody. I'm so happy and delighted to be here to join you for yet another one more session of G20 International. Yes, today we are going to talk about uh, agriculture and food safety, and our presidency is a global view of GVC's patterns, opportunities, and the role of the policy. The word agriculture is derived from the Latin words of agricultura from ager, and the field and cultura means cultivation or growing. it is commonly states to the activities of the human beings specific species of the beetle ant and termite that have been cultivating crops for over 60 million years earlier it is described that varying scopes and its widest concept of utilization and natural resources to produce commodities with sustain life including diet fiber forest products horticultural crops and their related services This is including arable farming, agriculture, animal husbandry, and forestry, etc., etc. So, agriculture definitely is the word that is more synonymous of the Indi- of our country, India. Agriculture is generally known as farming too. It is an art and science that the prudent endeavour to reshape the part of the earth's crust through cultivation of plants and other crops, as well as raising livestock for sustenance and other necessities for human being and economic grain agriculture plays an important role in the economic policy and the economy of a of a country not only of one country and of global economy as well as as well as it helps to shape up the financial sustainability of a particular country and it is considered to be the backbone of the economic system for developing for the developing countries for decades agriculture has been related with production of vital food crops but the present era of farming has evolved into different disciplines into different dimensions that country is dairy farming fruit farming forestry poultry beekeeping and arbitrary etc 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 so however it could be referred to as a promotion processing marketing and distribution of the crops the export imports of the live product livestock products etc etc and also one thing it doesn't fail to do it also provide employment opportunities to the huge percentage of the inhabitants of that particular country and even globally the industrial sector of depends upon the agriculture and the raw material too the inputs of the agriculture towards gdp is about 25% of the highest contribution in any other sectors and the following very very important or main points of agricultural factor it is the source of livelihood for many people almost about 70% of the population rely on agriculture for its livelihood contributing to the natural national revenue most developing countries depends on the uh, agriculture for its source of natural income or national income even while it's developed for while for developed countries it contributes a small fraction of the national income too and its supply of food as a fodder it provides food as a silage to the domestic animals moreover livestock provides milk and protein as people food and requirements so having a very great significance to international trade here we are gathered on this international platform t20 international to discuss on how agriculture can contribute to the global economy and how various commodities as sugar tea rice cotton tobacco coffee etc 
for the major items that contribute to the export to other countries. And this practice is helpful to decrease countries' critical balance of expenditures and saving foreign exchange too, not to mention optimism mentioned there. And also the volume, as well as to import the vital inputs, machinery, raw material, and other infrastructure that is supportive for countries' monetary development. So moving further, the advanced of agriculture sector share the marketable surprise. Most of the population relate to the manufacturing mining that depends on the food production that might meet the national marketable surplus. As agricultural sector development takes place, production increases and this leads to the expansion of the marketable surplus and as it reflects on the global economy. And uh, it re as it reflects on the global economy, it definitely decreases the rural poverty which is there in the sector. So GDP of the agriculture is about 4.1% of every year since 1975 to 2000. And the GDP increased due to the green revolution technology, improved seeds as well as the fertilizers that performed as chiefly part to enhance the agricultural production. So moving ahead without wasting much time, let's talk about more about, let's learn or let's get to hear more about agriculture on this platform from eminent personalities who have joined us today. Now coming to G20 platform, we know exactly what is G20 is all about because we have been hearing about it on every, every, every week and this is our seventh session as such, not to miss the mention there. Now what is G20? G20 is a forum of the 20 largest economies in the world that meets regularly to discuss the most pressing issues that, the, that, that is faced by the global economy. Together, the 20 countries are, accounts for the 80% of the world GDP, 75% of the global trade, and 60% of the population of the planet. The current members are Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and South Africa, Turkey, and the United Kingdom, and the United States, plus the European Union. What does the G20 discuss though? The G20 started in 1999 following the Asian financial crisis as a forum for financial ministers uh, and the central bank governors from the major developed and emerging economies to discuss the global financial crisis or the issues. Amid the global financial crisis in 2008, it grew into the leaders' summit, a place where presidents and prime ministers could get together for two days to try to solve the world's economic problems. Successful meetings of G20 leaders were held in Washington, D.C. in 2008, London in 2009, and Pittsburgh in 2009, having since, the, having since then fixing up annual fixations. So now it has divided into different forums which work together to contribute to the global economy. And the G20 presidency rotates between the members and it's picked from every each year, 2015. Now, coming relating to our topic, how is it related to us? Is that towards an innovative, invigorated, interconnected, and inclusive world economy? And this is the main objective of the G20. And uh, India being the one of the uh, 20 countries, India would have the privilege of holding the um, G20 presidency in the month of November, starting from this last year, December to November 2023. That's December 2022 to December November 2023. So our contributions will definitely evolve into a submission in that conference, and that's why we are gathered here. And coming to our session of G20 G20 International, what we have been doing in G20 International is that with its objective. of opening the forum to discuss on global issues. Way ahead, we had created a planner of, uh, yes, G20 schedule and its itinerary, starting with G20 plenary cycle of cycle one, which, which, will, which will be started in the month of February and it will go till May 23rd. Our first session was on topic Education 360, where we discussed about inclusive, equitable, 
relevant quality education and lifelong learning opportunities for all. So we covered most of the education topics with eminent personalities who contributed their inferences. Moving ahead, our second topic was focusing on women empowerment, which we titled, uh, titled it as Shakti Spectrum, where our presidency was a paradigm shift from women development to women led development. So we were able to talk about different issues for regarding the women empowerment. And for that particular session, we had a, a distinguished guest from UAE, Her Excellency Leila Rahal Al Aftani. She is a goodwill ambassador and a founder and CEO of Business Circle UAE. Moving ahead, we had our session on youth empowerment, where our presidency was on global youth leadership and partnership, where we discussed about uh, uh, leading to change, where uh, all the uh, innovation and 21st century skills, uh, which are required for the future of work, that is industrial revolution of 4.0, uh, where we had different eminent, eminent personalities from different fields, uh, were talking about and there were also quite a consolidated uh, youth participation during the session. Moving ahead, the fourth session that we contributed was STEM to the stream to team, uh, coin the team, where uh, we initiated, instituted, incorporated and innovated ideas on innovation in 21st century skills for a strategic framework of skill development and also sustaining robust training and policies and systems uh, finally contributing to the art of living and syncing with the nature. So moving ahead, our next session was was on entrepreneurship and MSME, where we talked about the policies and strategies which are required for enabling workforce that would uh, modernize and strengthen the industrial units uh, to make it to the global economy. And the second last that session that we have, we were focused upon was energy resources and resources for sustainability and employability, where our presidency talked about efficiency and sustainable use of natural resources for three hours in our e-dialogue. Uh, for this session, we had a, a very distinguished guest again from UAE, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Saeed al kendi the former Minister of Environment and, Environment and Water, representing from UAE. Along with them, we had engineer Alia al kendi who was again contributing towards the betterment of the society. And today, last but not the least, today we are gathered here with yet another topic of agriculture and food safety, where our presidency is going to talk about a global view of GVC patterns, opportunities, and the role of policy. So without wasting much time, we open the forum for every uh, for the participants to submit their inferences and we move on. On that note, I would extend a warm welcome to one and all and to all our distinguished speakers of today. So on that note, I would like to introduce our chief guest for today, Mr. Casey Bunsen. Warm welcome to you, sir. We are so highly happy to have you here. Just if you could allow me, I can just give you a, give a very small introduction to the gathered audience. Mr. Casey Bunsell is the Secretary of National Academy of Agriculture Sciences of India. And uh, Professor Bunsell obtained doctoral degree with the Globe Gold Medal from the Indian Agriculture Research Institute, IARI, New Delhi, India. He pursued an advanced research from Harvard University, Cambridge, USA, under the guidance of Professor Lawrence Bogart. Under the guidance of Professor Lawrence Bogart. Since his return from USA, he occupied eminent positions as professor in plant biotechnology at IARI, New Delhi, and coordinator of national project of transgenics and crops and the director of National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. 
under the Indian Council of this Indian Agricultural Research Department of Agricultural Research and Education, Government of India. He was the first to get selected from the prestigious Norman Barglob Chair, ICAR, National Professor for the Crop Improvement in India. Currently, Professor Bunsel is serving as a Secretary of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and is a member board of directors for the Global Plant Council. He is on the editorial board of Global Plant Biotechnology Journal UK as well. His research includes genome engineering and functional genomics, genomics for enhancing abiotic stress tolerance in crop, crops and plants. He has published 150 research articles in journals of international repute, including Natural, Nature Biotechnology, Natural Plants and Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, PNAS USA. He was instrumental in instrumentation of the International Treaty on Plants Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture in India. So on that note, we are so very happy to welcome you with us amidst us today, sir. Thank you so much. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Food is important. Food is important for peace. Food is important for prosperity. Food is important for livelihood security. Food is important for happiness. And food is important over all the economics of a nation or, 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 or of this world. So it drives the economy finally, and, and it goes through this particular kind of a value chain, according to me, to provide the peace, the prosperity, the happiness, livelihood, and then the economy. And also, we all belong to India, and Mahatma Gandhi, our Rashtrapita, once equated food with God. If you ask a hungry person, you know, and equated the, you know, food with, with God, and Dr. Norman Borlaug, the, the first food scientist or agricultural scientist who got this Nobel Prize ever was given Nobel Prize for peace. So food has that kind of value. And I'm very happy that we're talking today about this global value chain, talking about agriculture and food security. But then friends, I'm going to talk to you really speaking a new aspect altogether, you know, and adding kind of a concept of genetically modified food. See, people probably may not know much about genetically modified food when we talk of global value chain, but certainly it is one of the factors now driving into global value chain. And, and why do we talk about GM food crops? Why do we talk of GM food as a part of the value chain? And I'm sure you all know historically from the Indian perspective that we were, you know, kind of down with famines, many of them in India. I'm talking about even 19th century or you know, early part of 20th century. People were simply dying out of hunger. So then only the Dr. Norman Borlaug, actually speaking, he brought Green Revolution to this part of the world, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and around all those countries to increase the food production, particularly of wheat. And also other scientists contributed to production of, of rice. And that we term as Green Revolution. Our, our total production in 1960, for example, 1950 60s was around 50 million tons in India. That rose to today, we're talking of 300 plus million tons, 300 million tons in, in 2023, almost about, you know, like 60 years later. So that's the kind of progress the scientists, researchers, farmers, you know, progressive farmers have made it to increase the production. And today India is self-sufficient and we are in a position even to export export for money or also export to those who are needy. We, we exported, you know, to, to many of the countries which are otherwise having this kind of a conflict going on. You know, so we are doing pretty well that way. But that was the story we were talking about it, you know, 1960s, 70s. But then later, you know, again, the kind of pace of increase this productivity of food, you know, was not as high as we would have expected it over the years. So then new technologies came in. And some of those new technologies we are talking today are about like GM crops. Even after GM crops, there's another technology, you know, I'm, I will talk to you towards the end of my presentation about genome editing technology. So GM technology is something which, as I said before, uh, some studies have been carried out, you know, particularly with regard to GM soya bean, soya bean, which is tolerant to herbicides, 
and, and particularly in Argentina, Brazil, you know, 100% of the soybean is GM soybean, which is genetically modified soybean. I'm not going to the details of what GM is and all, but what I'm saying is that these are some of the improved cultivars of soybean, which are tolerant to herbicides and production of that way has increased tremendously, particularly in Argentina and, and, and Brazil, and of course in US and many parts of the world, you know, and globally, these GM crops are, are adopted when we talk of growing in their own land, about 25 to 30 countries, depending upon which year we are doing that analysis, and more than 190 million hectares is under the GM crops, you know, in the in let's say about 30 countries. But those are the countries, like including India, which are growing, which are harvesting the GM crops in the farmers' fields. But there are other 42 more countries, so total about 72 countries, which are consuming today as food or feed, you know, into their countries. So there's a kind of a value chain, you know, when you talk of as a product, a global value chain, right from production until the consumers to the plate or as a feed, you know, it, it is going through that kind of a, a, a value chain. And in, in, in India, particularly, it was only like 20 years ago in 2002, the first ever GM product, which was commercialized by government of India, a green signal was given. This technology is all regulated. I'll talk to you a little bit about that as well. So BT cotton, became a grand success. You know, BT is, is, is a, I don't want to go again into the details. It's a GM cotton, which pro provides resistance to ball warm. Ball warm causes otherwise, you know, um, it's quite a de devastating pest. It causes a lot of damage, you know, to, to, to the cotton crop, you know, and, and particularly to the balls which are formed and hardly there is any cotton. You know, if it is at all there, it will be very poor in quality. So BT cotton was introduced by government of India 20 years ago. And now 20 years after in 2023, we are in such a happy situation in India globally. We are probably the largest producer of cotton in the world. And cotton, not only we're talking about as a non-food crop, cotton oil, seed oil is a part of vegetable oil, which is also being consumed by consumers. And, and, and this cotton, in fact, now about 95% of our, you know, Indian farmers have adopted it, 95%. It's grown on about 11.9 million hectares, you know, and the productivity has drawn, grown up to at least three times. And international market share for India today is about 25%, which was only about 12% 20 years ago. So that, you know, the presence of India in the international market is doubled. And we, we are close to now China or US, you know, and when we talk of international market. And also the bigger benefit in the value chain, we talk about the production system point of view, livelihood as you're talking about it. BT cotton alone has given a benefit of 68% economic benefit, 68% to the farmers. And how it has given that kind of a benefit from two angles. One is that there's a reduction in the pesticide which the farmers will always keep spraying to kill that particular pest. So there is a 22% reduction there, you know, there's less pesticide which is utilized to the level of 22%. And the production has increased, production has increased to the level of 37%, and which has therefore resulted into this kind of a benefit, economic benefit to the farmers to the level of 68%. So these are actually some of the benefits, you know, particularly I'm talking of only BT cotton in India, and now we have GM mustard, genetically modified mustard hybrid, which has been only released, you know, last year. And, and that's the second GM crop which has been released in India and which is also um, a wonderful technology to increase the production of mustard along the value chain to 25 to 30 percent by increasing, you know, through the process we call it as hybrids, which are otherwise high yielding. And there are other benefits um, associated with, you know, these kind of technologies. I'm not going to go talk about it. But again, along the global value chain, when you talk of introduction of these GM seeds, I'm sure probably you all know that we have Convention on Biological Diversity, United Nations. And under that Convention on Biological Diversity, all diversity around the world needs to be sustained, need to be preserved, need to be sustainably utilized. And if it is utilized, benefit sharing need to be shared with, with, with the you know, farmers. So here there is a protocol attached to the CBD, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. Actually, when we talk of the introduction of the GM seeds into, into the global value chain, then it is the regulation, you know, which is being actually governed by all those national governments, wherever these, you know, seeds are produced or, or they, are, they, are, they are, you know, 
there's a movement of seeds across the countries in the world. These are all governed by international laws and Cartagena protocol on biosafety is, is one of them. So that's one which is important that, you know, global value chain, when we talk about it, these, you know, regulations, we need to be kept in mind. And, and the other regulation is that, you know, when from the point of origin where it is produced until the global chain, we need to keep its traceability. Many of the nations are talking about it to keep that traceability or retractability, retractability of the GM crops. You know, and there is a kind of a requirement of labeling at times, you know, along the value chain, if you want to really know where it is at the moment. So these are some of the problematic complex issues, you know, regulating these genetically modified crops when we talk of along the global value chain. But, but then again, there are other issues, unfortunately, that not all countries in the world are having harmonized regulations. Different countries, they have their different kinds of regulations. They're all on a case by case basis when we talk of these regulations of GM foods, you know, in different countries. Like India, we have only two crops today which have been given environmental signal, you know, to for commercialization is BT cotton and GM mustard. Whereas in US, there are about six to eight to 10 crops. In many other countries, there are many other crops, as I mentioned, about 29 to 30 countries. There are about in, in, in one dozen crops which are otherwise commercialized for food and feed, you know, or, or for, or, you know, like GM soybean, I mentioned to you about, is a part of the chocolate industry in, in Europe. So there, there are benefits, but then I said this technology is heavily regulated. And, and this point of view is that we must try to understand those regulations when we talk of its, you know, kind of movement across the globe, you know, as, as a part of global value chain. But one thing I would like to just tell you friends towards the end of my, this few more minutes presentation, that science is progressing quite a lot, you know, and, and through the sector of agriculture and producing more and more food, not only to meet our own requirements globally, it's important that we also drive economy, you know, particularly like country, India, where more than 50% of the population depend on agriculture. They thrive on agriculture directly and indirectly. So we need to have such technologies which can provide more peace to the farmers in the sense that they will be able to save time for their family. The children will be educated in addition to the livelihood security. So globally now, only about two years ago, 2020, you know, a Nobel Prize was awarded. This was another Nobel Prize awarded to a technology we call it genome editing. We call it wherein just like GM crops, this is another technology which is better than GM crops in many ways. With When we talk of regulation, still there's regulation, but it's quite minimal. And also when you talk of global value chain, what's the role of smallholder farmers versus multinational companies? So multinational companies dominate when we talk of the movement of these GM crops over the world in case of, you know, GM crops, or GM food crops, but in case of genome editing, which is new technology, just two years ago, I said a Nobel Prize awarded, otherwise the technology only about 10 years old. 2012, this technology was developed by two lady scientists who were awarded Nobel Prize, one from University of California and USA, another from, from France, who is otherwise working in Germany. And only 10 years ago, this technology took birth and is already making waves, not only in health sector, not only in agriculture, but also in health sector, diagnostics, pharma, even for COVID diagnosis or, or vaccination. This technology is quite heavily used. But fortunately, this technology is going to be utilized much more by smallholder farmers, by public sectors, you know, or even by small companies, unless, unless, uh, unlike, unlike, you know, kind of um, multinationals, which were more using you know, GM technology. Uh, for, for the transfer uh, or, or along the value chain. So the role was, MNC is playing a bigger role there, but here all companies, small or big, or public sector are also playing equally good role. And it's also available to smallholder farmers because it's not that heavily regulated from the government point of view. In India, actually only again last year, India has exempted these crops, some of the crops of this category, genome editing from biosafety regulation, from biosafety assessment and standard operating procedures have been have been devised so what i'm saying is that when we talk globally uh, other than conventional plant bidding when we're talking of global value chain of only not only one kind of a seed now there are other two ca different categories of seed which are regulated gm crops and now genome editing but genome edit editing is like more back to conventional bidding you know bread crops so there's less regulation so i think that more accepted 
you know, by the public at large globally as compared to GM crops. While GM crops are also safe, 25 years, people have been utilizing it, consuming it, you know, throughout the world. And mostly in US, as you all know, GM papaya, GM apple, you know, they've been all consumed and raw. And, and, and from biosafety angle, though some people raise questions, but they, it has been found for the last 25 years that GM crops are all safe. And they're a very important part of this global value chain and now genome editing. So with this, friends, I just wanted to introduce um, this particular new topic. I don't know how prepared you were to, to know about it. And uh, as I was not as much prepared to know something about global value chain, but I'm very happy. Thanks to Dr. Vidya. She, she you know, introduced me this topic. I'm happy to learn about it. But on the other hand, this was another topic in, in which I can talk and I have been contributing you know, at the national international level to whatever little extent, I thought I will introduce you to all this, this topic because that's also coming up. And accordingly, we should gear up ourselves when we talk of participation in these G20 countries. And many of the G20 partners are already consuming, growing, you know, these GM crops in their own countries or accepting now genome editing as well, as well as a tool to increase the production globally to talk about it. So with this, friends and Dr. Srividya, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be happy to and looking forward to listening to, to other presentations. And if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer those questions right now. Thank you again, all of you. Sorry, that. Thank you, sir. That was quite informative and insightful. And uh, definitely, we today we are gathered here to talk about the evolving food trade landscape in patterns of agrofoods and connecting it to GVC. Definitely, you have uh, uh, nailed the point saying that, yes, it is related to uh, some of the thing, planting of seeds in progress and how India is evolving in the agro agriculture biotech scene. Uh, for a country like India, ensuring that uh, sustainable food security is a rapid changing climate, definitely. In, is a significant concern of today. Yeah, definitely. With a slow piece of uh, yield increase, and it's crucial to accelerate the genetic movement of crops, uh, improvement of crops for enhancing the food production and achieving the cell sufficiency. Well, we do accept that GM crops play a major role in it and the rapid adoption of the science-based technologies for crop improvement and uh, gen, gen, gen editing, gene editing. Gene edited crops also play a major role in that. And uh, well, ensuring the sustainable uh, food security in a rapid changing climate is a significant concern for today. That also to be uh, taken into, there were a couple of questions related to that as well. We might take up the question of the session later and uh, uh, otherwise uh, should we ask for the questions now or we can just go ahead with that uh, we will try and post the question we can have questions now if they're there for sure yes uh, genetic crops are having a lot of limitation question uh, will be we will, take, we will take questions after later. okay we'll take the questions later sure sure Let's These are the questions. The, let's first discuss the probabilities, how we can do more ahead. That yeah. is the, and then we will take questions. So, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Casey uh, uh that uh, you are, uh, you have uh, mentioned so many things. So what is going on at present current and how, uh, what are the probabilities? What are the sectors in agriculture? How we can do it? As we have the very FPOs and uh, above uh, uh, 15,000 farmers are associated with our organization also, where that we are working uh, for the agriculture for millets also today, as this year is millets year. So, uh, uh, with respect to the integrated farming and uh, how uh, in a small land we can generate a multi layer farming, similarly, hydrophonic farming and uh, uh, rooftop garden and how we can produce a maximum uh, amount of uh, crops uh, and the vegetables uh, with respect to the demand of the uh, cities and metro cities uh, as uh, again the corona is uh, now emerging out so we have to uh, uh, this uh, production of the fresh and good vegetables so that uh, because there are so uh, at present again some uh, uh, mixtures uh, of and we can say the chemical based uh, and compound-based vegetables are coming, which is very harmful for our body. 
so uh, organic and natural farming and all vedic krishi so on that uh, we are also working and uh, as uh, you know the patents and all and similarly how the uh, new technologies can we can uh, 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 that is uh, uh, secured through ipr activities and also for the patents in grants and all we are also working for that for agriculture uh, for farmers and also associated with different types of industries who is working in the food grains and all how we can uh, export our uh, so, so many weeds and so many rices which are now damaged due to the rainfall and uh, due to the climate condition so uh, that, that's all uh, the challenges and also some uh, uh, there are vegetables and crops so some uh, at some place the the huge uh, we can say the production and uh, in some place there is a lack uh, at uh, at some place uh, to, uh, today the mangoes are reaching about 200 per kg and in some case where the uh, production cost is about 20 kg they are moving to uh, that is to sell for the 10 rupees per kg or 50 rupees kg so like that there is a difference in some this whatever you have talked also about the food supply chain so that is also the emerging issue that we have to uh, work for the supply chain so that the such type of differences will be overcome and we can do Uh, better for the uh, uh, to supply and demand. So, uh, such uh, we can do uh, something jointly. As you are in New Delhi, you know better how you are. We have to work and in this G20 uh, agriculture is the main sectors. Thank you. Sure. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salvia. Thank you very much for kind words. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay Kumar Salvia ji. Well, before we move on to the next speaker, I would like to register the questions which have come in, and so that we will be able to take them up to the end of the session. Kindly, I request the guests not to drop their numbers over there in the chat box. We will share your LinkedIn profile in the chat chat box, and once they get connected, we can share the numbers on a personal basis. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for considering that. Genital crops have talk about a, a global value chain. Uh, one common example where uh, which I studied is. Uh, a smartphone in china you know a smartphone assembled in china includes a, a graphic design from usa a computer code from france and a computer chip from singapore and then uh, uh, you know uh, various other things are included uh, and then uh, some heavy some precious metals from bolivia all these things are there in the chinese assembled uh smartphone but still all the countries who are involved in this they retain a part of the value in their own uh, country you know they also get profit and value out of the final sale of that product product is assembled in china sold somewhere for a value out of that value a part of the value is retained by uh, usa france singapore and bolivia everybody for their part they are also getting this thing this is what uh, you know the value chain is you know it's a cross border network that brings a product or process uh, from conception to the market you know that's how it is and other or having a lot of limitations sir. these are questions a question from jay jaspal singh j genital genital Crops are having a lot of limitation. Climatic change is a major challenge. What is your say on grafting? But organic seeds. There's another another question. But organic seeds are killed and now to be bought every time by the farmers because controlled by corporators. So do we have solutions for that? And the third one is. The effects of climatic change. I think this question will take up with the next speaker, and it is more related to it. Well, thank you, Professor Casey Bunsalji. Thanks for uh, addressing on that and evolving food trade landscape patterns of agro food GVCs. Thank you so much. It was very sure. informative and insightful. It, thank it, you. And uh, we would uh, request you to just stay on with the session if it is possible, and then. We shall catch up towards the end of the session for the summer. Sure, maybe I'll join towards the end, as you said, when we'll have more question answers to be done. Sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Moving ahead.
we have our next speaker for the day i would like to present before you mr durai raj kupurangam he has a 50 years of work experience in agriculture in various field of activity in 1968 onwards and uh, uh, with the first 3 years in the department of agriculture in tamil nadu and agriculture extension officer as a agriculture extension officer and 30 years in the marketing of agro agri inputs <laughs> of fertilizers crop care inputs micronutrients and biological inputs of rallis india limited and uh, he is uh, also worked as vice president of fertilizers at the time uh, in rallis in 2001 and also with uh, certification of training and activities for uh, he has visited countries like ethiopia ghana and for project reports uh, for different projects uh, and also he has established noble agro biotech private limited a seed company in bangalore and uh, presently he is as a president of international uh, international competence center for organic agriculture i c c o a ecoa Yes, I got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for that help. And um, uh, well, um, sir is going to address around about uh, different points that has been mentioned in our flyer. That's what uh, he was very particular about. And uh, without wasting much time, I would like to present before you, Mr. Duray Raj. Mr. Duray Raj, good program, sir. The floor is all yours. We are so very happy to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Vijay sir, Dr. Sri Vidya ma'am, uh, and then Aparupa, and all the distinguished uh, Professor uh, Bansal who has given a very good lecture, and all the distinguished uh, speakers who are waiting here. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, uh, the organizers. The main point I was going to talk is about promoting more inclusive and sustainable agro food GVCs. you know that's a topic given to me first let us uh, look at the evolving food trade landscape the world food uh, landscape the total cultivable area the whole world is about 1.5 billion hectares 1.5 billion hectares which is about one third of the land area of the earth so, uh, that is 1.5 billion hectares in that we are producing goods worth of food products worth of 7.7 trillion us dollars that is being consumed by all the 8 billion population plus all the cattle which they are rearing and that's a way we have been doing agriculture business and then 45% of the 8 billion population is totally dependent on agricultural profession anything that happens to agriculture this very heavy uh, you know amount of people will be affected you know this is the the world uh, you know situation about agricultural production and now there is a new segment which is emerging that is the organic food segment this organic food segment is about 20 years old from 2000 onwards uh, from us you know it has taken a shape and then now uh, the total sales of organic food at the moment is about 188 billion us dollars 188 us billion dollar is the total value of organic food sold in the world out of that 60 billion is consumed only by usa they are the number one consumer of organic food next comes european union which is about 50 million dollars then comes china and various other countries india is having about 140 million hectares of cultivable land but just about 4 million hectares we have now covered under organic certification about 4 million hectares of the, from that we are exporting about 1 billion dollar worth of organic food outside that contains not only food food fiber and uh, beverages all put together it's about 1 billion dollar uh, out of the total 188 billion dollar world trade our contribution is just about a billion dollar that may be because although 
we have very large uh, you know net area cultivated almost equal to china uh, we are number 1 or number 2 between china and india in spite of it all are small holders and most of them are naturally you know they are going into organic farming only uh, very large farmers are not using much chemicals and all that but they have not got the certification only the certified organic products are traded across the world so that is uh, one thing so there are quite a number of people who have not yet been certified and they are all waiting to join the bandwagon now why this uh, sudden spurt in uh, organic food you know last 20 years uh, people have been talking about organic uh, food that is because of health problems you know people have heard about chemical pesticide and herbicide you know what is the harm that is causing to them and their uh, families and all that then chemical fertilizers what kind of damage it is doing to the soils of the uh, world and then the synthetic hormones which are being used and then antibiotics genetic modifications irradiation and bio contaminants like aflatoxin e coli you know these are all things which are coming into our food supply chain and it is causing health problems to uh, people so instead of going to the hospitals and spending lakhs of rupees people would love to prevent these diseases by avoiding them and then taking care of their health you know that is why after the pandemic it has triggered such a big uh, you know jump and people have started using uh, healthy food and then food that is uh, give uh, good stamina and all that you know chemical pesticides and herbicides are very dangerous you know these we are now selling in india about totally our production is about 60000 crores out of 60000 crores 30000 crores we are exporting to other countries we use 30000 crore worth of pesticides that includes fungicides insecticides herbicides and everything all these things put together part of it goes into our tomatoes and potatoes and chilies and brinjal and everything we unknowingly we consume everything we don't get uh, you know killed immediately it takes about 5 years 10 years or 15 years depending upon your resistance it all goes and deposits on the parts of uh, various organs in your body and later on it gives some kind of problem kidney failure and then you know uh, even cancer and all these things are caused by these kind of pesticides herbicides and various other things and people would like to avoid that then chemical fertilizers how do they damage see uh, in soil there are huge number of microbes the microbes are the ones which is giving us Uh, so much uh, nutrients to our crops although we think that uh, chemical fertilizers like urea dap and potash and uh, various other things are giving nutrients that is all uh, recently about 40 50 years we have been using that before 50 years all these chemical fertilizers were not there and still we were growing crops and we were still getting our grains and fruits and vegetables everything only difference is that we are getting little more and little bit conveniently the convenience and little bit extra yield but that extra yield has got a cost that cost is our health you know these the chemical fertilizers when they go into the soil they may also reduce the population of the microbes the microbes what they do is they collect the nitrogen from the air and then feed into the soil there are certain microbes which are bringing the phosphoric acid you know they solubilize this and feed it to the crop and then there is another bacteria which will mobilize the potash and bring it to the crop you know although the soil has got all this nitrogen phosphorus potash magnesium everything is there but plant cannot directly take it it requires some somebody to feed it for example if i keep before you a plate of rice dal oil chili powder salt everything and eat your lunch if i say you will not eat it somebody has to cook it properly and then give it and then only it will be palatable and you will be able to digest it assimilate it so in the same way in the soil everything is available but it is the microbes which has to do the 
job of converting that into the nutrient and giving it. When you apply chemical fertilizers, number one, it may reduce the population of these microbes. How much microbes are there in the soil? In a fertile soil, if the soil is very fertile and it has got fertile means it should have at least 1% organic matter in that soil. There are about, in a gram of soil, about 10 crores microbes. You know, so much of microbes are there and they are all working. Since we have not seen it through our eyes, we don't believe it. But it is all there. If you through your uh, microscope, you will see all these bacteria and all that. So, these kind of bacteria are all reduced uh, by application of chemical fertilizers. Apart from that, chemical fertilizers also make the soil very hard and then and extra nitrogen and phosphate goes and pollutes your water bodies like uh, your uh, open uh, water or uh, water uh, under the soil. Everything is polluted because of excess fertilizers. And then comes the synthetic hormones. You know, some time back uh, in Europe, there was human cry when uh, RBGH is a hormone, recombinant bovine growth hormone. These hormones, when they are injected into the cows, you can get some extra milk. Just for that extra milk, they wanted to inject this kind of hormones and out of pain and uh, uh, and pleasure, you know, uh, you know, problems, they have uh, given extra milk. And over the time, there, it also affected their uh, health and even the pus came out of the udder. You know, when they were milking, when, when they saw pus in the milk, people were alarmed. You know, this is the greediness, you know, when you put so much strain on the animals uh, through the hormones and all that, this is also not uh, wanted by the organic uh, consumers. Antibiotic is another thing. You take chicken or egg or meat or whatever it is, uh, a lot of antibiotics is very widely used. For example, in our case, when we get sick, when we go to the doctor, he gives a uh, antibiotic pill or an injection or something like that when you get sick. But in the case of animals, it is a daily dose of antibiotics. As though as a growth promoter, they give it to all the chicken in their feed or in the water. Uh, every day they are fed and when these things go into their system, the body, uh, you know, converts all these bacteria as resistant bacteria. This is resistant to uh, antibiotics. These things, when you eat afterwards, your body also gets the antibiotic resistant bacteria and all that. And your doctor, when he gets, gives you a dose of antibiotic, doesn't work, you know. So these kind of dangers people want to avoid. That's why they wanted organic thing. GMOs. Professor has uh, uh, said very nicely about the technological improvement about organic, sorry, uh, genetic modifications. Yes, of course, I, I'm also a student of agriculture science. I always adored and I always respected scientific developments and all that. It's all going on, but still a lot of organic farmers suspect that it has not got a, a long term uh, uh, this thing, outlook. You know, in a very short term, they are thinking and they are doing, that's how they blame. But I'm not convinced. I, I'm with the doctor, uh, Professor uh, Bansal, and then I'm still not fully convinced, but the organic regulations in United Nations and European Union, they have all banned use of genetic crops in organic uh, farming. In organic farming, it's not allowed. So this has to be convinced. I am very sure that in India, I have seen when I was working in Rallies India, I have sold a lot of pesticides and fertilizers on cotton and uh, I have seen how much of pests are attacking them and all that. When Monsanto's uh, uh, cotton came into existence, this uh, BT cotton, uh, there was uh, uh, bollworm is what he was telling, you know, three bollworms are there, uh, green and then, you know, heliotis and then pink bollworm, all these things were affecting and uh, they were giving a lot of problems and when bollworm, uh, BT cotton came, uh, they were able to control much and then they got very good yield also. When our farmers used to get six to seven quintals of cotton, they were able to get 10 to 12 quintals of cotton and all that and it was a boon for many cotton farmers. That is why at that point of time, there were only 9 million hectares of cotton in India. In, out of 140 million total area, only 9 million and 9 million has become 12 million 
and out of 12 million 98 percent is or uh, genetic cotton only people are convinced they are, they are convinced they will take over but in the case of food crops that is fiber crop although there is a little bit of cotton is used for oil and also but mainly it is a fiber crop whereas when we are talking about rice wheat vegetables and all that it is food crop this is where people are afraid that whether it will cause some kind of harm whether it will be safe whether uh, the scientists have taken full control over the you know all parameters you know these are all things where genetic modification also is a problem for organic farmers irradiated food also uh, has caused a lot of uh, problems and they don't want irradiation in uh, organic food and biocontaminants like e coli aflatoxins these are all common in storage products and all that so all these things have triggered the hope for organic food people wanted to be healthy they wanted to take care of their uh, uh, family and their uh, you know close ones and all that and that's why this uh, market is growing at the moment i told you world over about 188 uh, billion dollar worth organic food is consumed and then it is growing uh, in uh, usa it is growing at the rate of 10 percent and in Europe, it is growing at 15%. And in India, it is growing at the rate of 23%. Because we do not consume much uh, organic food in India, but there is a lot of export opportunities, mainly for spices, and then a lot of uh, uh, oil seeds, soybean, and various other things are being exported from India, and they get uh, good money on that. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to get some problem with my computer. Uh, I think I might uh, stop with this because uh, I have some problem with my computer. Uh, with this, I would like to close it. In another occasion, if you have, uh, we will uh, talk more. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. That was quite informative. And uh, I think you have covered almost all of our pointers today, uh, starting from the evolution of food trade landscape and the patterns of agro-food GVCs, shares and growth of total agro-food value traded in GVC, that also we have talked about, benefiting from GVC, GVC's participation, like how we can contribute to the global economy, that also we have touched a little bit, and the factors that influence the agro-food GVC participation, that also we have taken into consideration. And moreover, like uh, last but not the least, the shares about agricultural workforce being employed in the agro-food agro GVC, that also uh, we have taken into consideration uh, during your presentation. Thank you so much, sir. It was quite, very, quite insightful, quite informative, and thanks for being here. It was a great pleasure having you here. Uh, Aparupa Patnaik, are there any questions from the audience for uh, Mr. Doradaj? Yes, ma'am. Uh, maybe I will come back with my telephone later on. My sure. computer is... Uh, we can take the question, sir. We can come up with the answers later. Aparupa, okay. please go ahead. You can register the question the here. was from Mr. Jean that the effects of climate change have negatively impacted agricultural productions. Yeah. And these are the effects that manifest themselves not only in India, but also in other parts of the globe. So, uh, is there any intervention that you can suggest uh, in terms of dealing with the climate change and how it is adversely affecting the agriculture? So, that was the question. Uh, this is uh, in organic, you know, in organic agriculture, the, the sequestration of carbon in the soil through growth of leguminous crop is what you know is one of the subjects i would suggest uh, is an answer to that because in agriculture we have to bring down the carbon from the atmosphere and uh, carbon sequestration through leguminous crops you know we are doing rotation crop rotation when we grow maize this year next year it will be legumes like pulses when you grow pulses, they uh, fix nitrogen, plus we also, uh, you know, bring down the carbon uh, through the photosynthesis and all that. So this is how uh, 
sequestration of carbon is one answer i would say uh, for the climate change and uh, that that's one thing i would say for the time being thank you sir and there was one other question more related to your field that's why i'm registering it so fast sorry about it what's your opinion yeah. about genetically engineered crops does it change as our no, life no i told you i have in two minds you know as a student of science i appreciate all the organic genetic modifications done because yes. if there are some crops suffering through uh, you know uh, various issues they have found uh, you know solutions that is okay but what is uh, amongst the mind of the organic growers is that there is a fear that fear has to be removed that you know like in uh, soybean roundup ready soybean in usa what they have done is they have put a gene from uh, hazelnut or no brazil nut brazil nut gene has been brought into uh, soybean and from soybean they extract oil so far they have been consuming soybean oil nothing happened but when roundup ready soybean oil was used by some consumers they got allergies in their body this is you know the report i am not i can't authenticate reports in the us journals and all that uh, that there is allergies this allergic symptom has appeared because of the hazelnut not because of uh, soybean but hazelnut gene has been put into soybean that's why it is coming like that they are concerned they are considering number of crops for example uh, strawberry has got frost a uh, problem in the uh, united states they want to arrest that and save the crop from frost for that they are bringing a gene from a fish in the Ar arctic ocean from arctic ocean the fish is able to uh, tolerate the freezing temperatures so why don't you bring that gene and put it into the uh, strawberry and tomato and all that these are all the stories going around it is the job of these companies to sort out the issues and say that there is nothing much dangerous you know people think that there is going to be a long term effect on human beings animals and plant kingdom if it is not checked properly that right. is the thing i hold at the moment right. i am not totally against dr bansal's uh, uh, statement but these are all some of the issues to be crushed out this question is from mr hamid sir rasul who says that is it better and why we graft with other plants as it is against the future that's against the nature grafting, grafting is not just an exercise grafting hybridization this is all allowed and it is all like we are having intercaste marriages and all that you know that's how it is done but genetic modification is bringing a gene from another species totally you know uh, that, that is not uh, worthwhile that's what they say and also sir has registered a point there use of artificial gases for ripening the fruit are we for it it is ethane for ethylene for example if you are using it's not wrong because your banana bunch is ripening because of ethylene only naturally uh, you know emitted ethylene is ripening one row of uh, banana ripes and then it emits ethylene that ripens the next row fingers like that only naturally it happens and you can use that that's not a problem but uh, ripening mango through calcium carbonate you know that's wrong that will cause lot of ailments thank you so thank you thanks for answering those questions very patiently thank you so much it is a very great pressure having you here and thanks no, for I, I, we, we we can do we can start working on that uh, sir you can contact us whatever plan you have then we yeah. will definitely work on Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much. So we will. I will just leave the question with you in your WhatsApp so that you will be able to come back with us. Definitely. Okay. Just for sure. simply, definitely, I will leave the question with him. He will be joining us before the end of the session, and you can yes. have your uh, answer. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. The arrow also. I am not able to move the arrow also. <laughs> no problem, sir. Definitely, I'll share the question in your WhatsApp, and you can join us with your phone. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a great Thank pleasure you. having you, sir. Thanks for the support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. So moving ahead, thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Venkatraji Umadi who has been with us before. 
and about a brief introduction about, uh, I would like to introduce about uh, Dr. Reddy. Dr. Veng Reddy Umadi is a senior scientist from Hyderabad and has been practicing for the past years. Working as a visiting scientist of the Department of Chemistry, American University of Sharjah, Sharjah UAE, and worked as an end scientist at the Department of Chemistry, Osmania University, Hyderabad, India. Fast track end scientist award from the Department of Science and Technology, and uh, also he has worked as a postdoctoral associate at uh, Institute of Technology and MIT, Cambridge, USA. Venkat, Dr. Venkat Reddy is currently working at the Department of Chemistry, American University of Sharjah, and as a research in the organic chemistry, then our, and nano, nanotechnology and materials chemistry as well. So it's a great pleasure having you, sir. And uh, the, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, Dr. Reddy is going to speak about crops, fruits, and other vegetables and sustainable crops. Thank you. Thank you so much. The floor is all yours, Dr. Reddy. Please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Srividyaji, Dr. Srividyaji, kind introduction about me. Uh, the, um, uh, going to, I'm happy to join with you second time. Uh, last time stream I joined uh, 13th March. Uh, about, uh, about me. Can I share my slides? Please, you can. If you have any problem, let me know. Please. This is my field where I ca capture my photo. Most of them, I'm from Hyderabad, uh, where we are uh, cultivating the most of the, uh, uh, like a paddy. A paddy, like a uh, rice fields are, we are very, uh, we have plenty of water. Uh, I'm Nagarjun Sagar, dam called Nagarjun Sagar. The people are working here, like a, this is my field. Uh, I'm, I'm an agricultural background. This is the, uh, this is a kind of introduction to, uh, about me, uh, Dr. Uh, Venkat Reddy, Ayurvedic Medicine Research Scientist. My company is Dr. VJP Pharma Private Limited. This is a kind of introduction about me. I worked as a uh, research scientist in MIT, Massachusetts, Institute of Technology, and as well like uh, 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 American University of Sharjah. Now I've been working with them last six years. Uh, like this is very uh, about my little introduction. Like uh, this is a book where I published in nanotechnology applications. This is my credentials. Sir, I have 33 patents worldwide. Uh, I'm working. I uh, published a book. We have given several international talks and the work as a government young scientist and international and a national uh, topics. This is my lab where I'm working. Uh, these are the organic products uh, where uh, Ayurvedic medicine uh, research I'm doing. We have excellent products to cure human healthcare. Here I'm going to start my presentation here. Here, I'm going to talk about the uh, organic uh, uh, agricultural field, women, uh, empower, uh, women involvement in this. Uh, very actually, uh, in, in our area, most of the people are, most of the people are uh, like a 50%, uh, 50% 50 families are dependent on the agriculture. They are more, uh, they are more in the, uh, like uh, their family members are, all family members are involving in this agriculture, like a, uh, uh, in Nepal, most of the women, women are uh, participating in uh, agricultural farming and the Pakistan next followed by the India is the 50%, 56% women are participating in the agriculture. But here, uh, only they are working in the fields, they are not in the really in the market, uh, uh, they are not doing the business as well. They are just like that, the involving as a, uh, like a uh, regular uh, employee, like that, regular police, uh, like that. But they are, they are the lack of the education, lack of the communication, they are the transport problems and other things. They are not much involving in the business side. These are the very less in the Japan, just like 3% uh, people are involving in this. Again here, agriculture, agriculture is not the, uh, not these days, they, this is not, uh, not much profitable. That's what there are people are uh, people are converted people are changing their uh, fields to the uh, like uh, uh, agriculture to the uh, business side in uh, 90s 90 people are more in the agriculture side 70 percent now this is the uh, transitional economy is a decreasing and uh, it's like a develop to the economy like a 
different sectors they are trying to why means these fields are global farming uh, global warming or whatever uh, uh, they are unable to sell their products in proper proper uh, uh, profitable uh, way they, they have the limitations to the uh, send their products to the uh, market why means they are they are more they are more uh, depend on the uh, like a uh, middleman that's what they are trying they are not trying to get the more profits that's what they are trying to change their their uh, fields to the other side nowadays we have we have very good technology to uh, use the agriculture farming agriculture farming and other uh, whatever uh, natural farming and other things but wheels are very less compared to uh, modified genes and the other techniques those 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 who are using this uh, genes modified and the uh, more pesticides and other uh, uh, chemicals urea like that this yields are good but that that food is not good for the health we are many we are exposed to the many diseases like the cancer and other chronic diseases and other things that is a very major issue in this uh, uh, like a, a gene modified and the pesticides uh, used uh, food now, that's what people are now now they are trying to change the their uh, their mindsets to the uh, farming organic farming side this is the one where where we are going to uh, work on now i am working on the organic farming side and the like a, uh, like uh, the, the yields are compared to uh, gene modified these are less but this is good for the health that whatever food we take the in uh, whatever uh, as a food uh, most of the most of the uh, consume uh, whatever most of the people are using the pesticides very harmful pesticides that that, that is not good for the health that's what we are uh, trying to use the organic farming uh, like a, a uh, gochar gochar means here go based uh, economy go based economy and go based agriculture uh, farming and the what uh, do you if you get good less yields also but the food is uh, more uh, more uh, useful for the uh, body like it uh, will uh, will minimize the diseases what you are taking inside good good food good health that's what you are trying to this the uh, yields are yields again i'm talking about the yields yields is less but is but uh, compared to uh, modified gene modified and pesticide food this is the good for the health this is what i'm trying to say this here global global economy global economy depend on the global economy depend on the how agriculture sector is growing up but here nowadays the people are not getting more uh, profitable uh agriculture that's what they are they are they increase the pesticides uh, cost they are they increase the labor cost and they are increase the uh, like a, whatever uh, consumables and what they are using but uh, after completion of their uh, uh, crop they are unable to unable to sell the their products which are uh, which are profitable uh, margins that's what they are not uh, interested to go the and they are not interested to do uh, agriculture fields they are they are trying to if i am the uh, like a farmer uh, uh, son now my father has not interested to uh, uh, um, do uh, keep me in the agriculture side that's what i i am uh, studied and i am going out and i am doing different thing but this is not the good for uh, long sustainability Yeah, everyone. Whatever you are doing, what we have to take the food. We have to cultivate the food. We have to agriculture is very important. Main main source is the agriculture. What we have to do the agriculture in sustainable way. That's what I'm trying to say. This. Oh, uh, for this, I'm going to uh, stop my presentation here. Thank you, Sri Vidya Ji. thank you so much uh, like there is one question one uh, i would say there is one registration from mr prashant regulate use of fertilizers strictly with lab validations so that's what he is asking about regulate actually actually here uh most of the people are cultivating the one one crop every time like uh, for example on my side my where i grown up all always they are trying to, uh, to do agriculture with the paddy only that they are not getting getting good yields but when you change that uh, uh, fields with the other other 
farms like leguminous families and other the fund it's like a uh, different um, uh, 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 land uh, land is fertile when when you chase the crop to crop to crop but always one crop is not good uh, we'll get we'll we'll uh, end up with the less wheels that's what i'm and uh, he is uh, continued so self first meaning naturally grown to be for the local consumption by labeling organic we are deprived of various foods that are made available cost effective kindly comment sir that's that's what uh, if you get good uh, less yields also this is the more uh, like uh, now nowadays stores are uh, here and there but compared to chemically uh, exposed food like a, like a normal food organic stores are compared to little uh, ex, uh, expensive but it is good for the health when you take that food uh, that uh, some diseases are not discussed with you many people are with less it's a, like a age, there is no age factor there is small kids also like a 20 years kids 25 years kids also exposed to the uh, this kind of foods they are getting some chronic problems or like a cancer also they are end up with the cancer and other things also but here control the pesticides control the pesticides with limited use of the pesticides or the uh, you whatever uh, uh, harmful chemicals uh, end up with the less yields also we will get the good good uh, profit on this and uh, will will sell this products at little higher cost that's no no issues he exposed to the diseases and going to the hospitals is not good for health good for anyone health is very important to uh, what you are eating what you are doing what you are taking inside is the very important that is the when i'm I, as a as a scientist and doctor i'm saying that many people are uh, they are they are taking uh, uh, they don't know what they are uh, that, that food is containing it's like a, there is no nu- nutrition side nutrition side. besides that there are uh, uh, there are many chemicals exposed foods are taking that's the reason if it is getting good less reels also no problem but it will get the little uh, more cost one compared to the this food yeah. thank you sir thank you so much are there any questions from anybody uh, we can stop good sharing sir. good sir it is uh, your cooperation is good regarding that you are in the nano technology also also you are in the ayurved and now agriculture and health sector so and also you have patented so many things so uh, and also you have talked about that the generation uh, even your son is not interested but uh, it is uh, the agriculture is uh, the uh, future and sustainable so that's uh, we want that uh, uh, as uh, uh, we are uh, uh, facing the problem with the uh, like mosquitoes uh, before 30 years or 40 years uh, the mosquitoes was not the problem for the biting and for the we were happiness in life but today uh, as we have the uh, mats and all good diets and whatever uh, we have the uh, repellent and all even the dengue malaria and all are uh, uh, we are facing the problems and uh, because we are uh, uh, we can say the uh, far from the shops and hubs uh, the ayurvedic whatever we have so uh, that that's why we are not uh, we have no immunity uh, though we can say the peace in mind so everyone is in tension and headache um, uh, only because of just uh, the work culture and uh, however there is a means uh, shortage of such type of immunity uh, or such type of we can say the food and uh, such type of uh, ayurvedic medicines and all the medicines in the sense the Uh, the mixture of all our herbs and shrubs so that uh, we have to work on that and also we have to put uh, such type of activities in our new generations so that they will get uh, the knowledge and also to work out and also to go there however iits and iims people are coming in this side but uh, even uh, the most of the we can say in middle class and upper middle class there is uh, only a uh, uh, to make their life uh, only uh, we can say materialistic not uh, we can say the happiness or sustainable type so and that uh, that is the we can say large crowd in uh, all over the world and in country and th- that is the main problem we have so uh, you uh, you have uh, i have seen your whatever uh, uh, and uh, you have the uh, huge plan 
in your mind i think and you you need a team for that so uh, whatever the products you have whatever on which you are working please send us we will uh, definitely work on it and also the new emerging areas we can for that we can uh, associate and we can work on that because you are a scientist also we are also in the research so we can develop so many activities and so many uh, whatever the emerging sector sectors True. in a better world because as you are aware of the nano technology also so how a nano technology means a nano part is useful for uh, the health and uh, you we you also know the nano part is useful for the nuclear reactor also that is yes. the big big bang uh, we can theory and our energy radiation sources yes, so energy radiation sources electricity electronics and telecommunication and uh, telecommunication technology iot artificial intelligence and uh, say now medical health and agriculture so the, the you are a good mixture of all things and definitely we can uh, sort out the sectors where we can develop the world you send sure. all proposals to our numbers whatsapp number email i have all already mentioned in the chat box and uh, we will work out sure thank you sir yeah thank sure you. thank you dr reddy thank you vijay kumar sir ji and uh, dr reddy thanks for all those information that was quite in informative and statistical rather than uh, you know like uh, as we have been to- talking and registering in general that was quite uh, to the point and to the specific actually the measure specific that i would like to mention here for so as we all know that uh, agriculture and food chains are becoming have becoming increasingly centralized around specific herbs uh, with the ends of value chains centralized around china us germany that's what it starts of uh, dr reddy was showing and these countries have driven much of supply and demand for value added within agro agro food gvcs and china in particular has emerged a key player in the agro food gvcs and according from the largest increase in the use of agro food value added for exports and in the supply of agro food value added exports in forward linkages between agro food gvcs is close to about 20% 37% that we have seen in the chart as such and <laughs> exceeding from the sum of about three largest contributors of Brazil, US and India, many developed countries have remained significant drivers of agro-food GVCs, even increasing their importance in the GVC network, despite shifts in the location of the production growth towards emerging and developing countries. Many countries in Europe, for example, have been the responsible for the significant share of the growth in the trade of the agro-food food value between 2004 and 2014. beyond sourcing and supplying for exports concentration is also remains in the buyers of the agro food value added to the service of the domestic consumers either the final products or other intermediates so to have to know more about it i would like to extend and present before you mr manoj sanwar mr mr manoj sanwar he yes. is uh, he is representing godavari industries from uh, from india and he is a sales and marketing director of godavari industries and they have exports and imports they have been excelling in the field of export and imports in throughout different countries and um, moving ahead to know a little more about uh, mr manoj sanwar so would you like to introduce yourself sure uh, good afternoon everyone Thank you, sir. i hope i am audible yes sir you are audible please go ahead thank you thank you sir thank you please sure. go ahead Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, respected speakers and all the attendees. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudhirji, for giving me an opportunity to present my views on this topic uh, of GVC in uh, agricultural sector. Uh, as you have uh, briefly uh, mentioned about me, uh, I work in. A com- uh, I'm a partner in a company called Godavari Industries, where we are manufacturers of corn grits. Uh, corn grits is basically. Uh, uh, Grits produced from corn, uh, maize. Now uh, the applications uh, for these corn grits is basically uh, using uh, all the extruded snacks uh, like the kurkurees and the cheese ball and the the rings that you see in the market. Uh, these days, earlier we all have been used to all the Indian traditional snacks, but now with the new technology of the, the new concept of extruded snacks, there has been a growing demand for corn grits. 
Uh, I know all the speakers here are quite technical, quite qualified, and have a great uh, research insight uh, and having a detailed background. Uh, I present here uh, my views from non technical background, which is from the commercial and the practical domain. Uh, again, uh, as I said, uh, the products that we, we manufacture is all uh, produced from the agricultural goods, which is corn, uh, which is used in the snacks industries. Also, uh, a lot of corn uh, grapes are used in the animal feed industries, used for pig feeds, bird feeds, and horse feeds, etc. Uh, uh, Dr. Bansal rightly said that uh, food is very important for world harmony and peace. And uh, to add to this, I feel GDC is very important to achieve this world harmony. If the global value chain is, is stable and acceptable, uh, the world harmony uh, obviously would have to uh, spend them. As you all know and agree that agricultural goods are very sensitive to climate conditions, global volatility and market situations. Hence, it is uh, very critical to have a very GV, uh, good GPC policies so that these factors should be taken and these factors should be taken as a priority not just by uh, all the G20s but all other countries together. So, uh, as we have seen recently, every countries uh, are trying to increase their export values, uh, export volumes, uh, trying to be self uh, defend, uh, self sufficient, and not depend on any other countries. But at the same time, they have to make sure uh, that the domestic stability is not disturbed. When I say this, to give you an example, uh, as much as India would like to push exports of maize or rice, they have to as well make sure that because of the push to exports, it does not disturb the local uh, rates or values of those grains. Now, India, uh, fortunately, in these recent times, has been doing a remarkable work in this, uh, especially with the uh, good policies, with the good storage facilities, cold chain uh, infrastructures, uh, subsidizing, uh, subsidies uh, benefit given by the government to the uh, FPOs, FPCs. Uh, and as uh, Dr. said, uh, a lot of subsidized urea fertilizers are even given by the government. And on top of this, uh, to add to the uh, good volumes that India has been exporting, uh, ease of doing and ease of export uh, recently has been an important factor in this. Uh, Mr. Mohairaj gave a very good example of uh, GVC, uh, but gave an example of uh, uh, mobile where the, some parts are bought in from different uh, countries. But let me give you an example which is much more related to our topic that is agriculture. Now, we, Godavari Industries, uh, manufacture corn grits. Now, corn grits is a raw material for the extruded snacks. Now, there are clients who are manufacturing extruded snacks, let's say in UAE or Bahrain or Qatar, they import corn grits from India. Obviously, the extruded machines are imported from either European countries, China or India. A lot of flavors are bought from, uh, again, European countries, Malaysia. Oil has been imported from Indonesia, from Malaysia. So there are all these uh, dependent countries to just produce a single product. Now, this, this sets a very good example here for this forum of how the GVC works and how it is so critical to even produce a small uh, product like this. Now, uh, Lately, what we have seen is uh, with the uh, uh, dependency or with the push in uh, agricultural sectors in India, uh, the exports of Indian uh, agricultural goods, especially I can speak about maize, uh, two years back it was around 1 million, around, uh, 1 million metric ton uh, was exported from India. Now, recently, in last 21 22, it, is, it, is, it has increased almost 3.5 times and we are exporting around 3.6 million metric ton in 2022. So all this could happen with all the good facilities, subsidies and uh, good environment for, for business. Uh, obviously, a lot of factors uh, do control uh, in our uh, business, especially the recent uh, Ukraine war uh, has hampered exports from Ukraine and that has become more, uh, the exports have been uh, increased from India to uh, support that or to compensate that. So, uh, 
for us as an uh, agri- agricultural uh, producing company or, or a value added company on uh, value added products we feel global value chain is very very critical uh, to bring that harmony to bring uh, ease of flowing the material and uh, it's just not one country who could form contribute it has to be like g20 is playing a very important role in, in making sure the policies are are, are uh, clear transparent are flexible so that nobody should think just for its own country but have to make sure that uh, the uh, global food uh, factor is taken care of very well now uh, just to add to the the, the norm the gmo part uh, the experience that we have from the gmo part uh, is that a lot of clients rather many countries are still restricting imports of uh, gmo material and uh, fortunately in india uh, we do not have the gmo in form so a lot of countries do prefer indian corn for the exports so this is going to be a, a big detail discussion debates for whether gmo is good or bad but uh, from a business perspective uh, it is still uh, a learning thing for a lot of consumers and Regarding the GMO, if it has to go further, and if, if you see advantage in GMO, then there has to be a good communication and benefits uh, communicated to everyone. Uh, any again, uh, a lot of other speakers are coming from a background where they are either professors or doctors. I'm coming from a background of uh, pure commercial things, so I I prefer uh, an interaction things, and I would be happy to answer any of the questions. Regarding commercial or the practical situation of of agricultural material, and uh, that's where that's where I stop my uh, few experiences uh, to you. Again, as I said, I mean I have explained to uh, Dr. Sudhir Ji that we have been exporting from India to almost twenty five, twenty six countries now, and uh, the the volume that we have been exporting has uh, increased drastically. We started our exports in two thousand thirteen. Uh, where our uh, export volumes at that time were around four to five percent. Now we have reached forty percent of our uh, production uh, volumes that we export. So uh, all these things is because of the awareness, uh, world getting smaller, and uh, ease of uh, business in India. Right. Thank you, Dr. Sudhir. You are not available. Yes, welcome, sir. Uh, yes, uh, uh, your uh, your company is working in the areas of which field? Uh, we are manufacturers of corn grits. Uh, corn grits is basically a smaller uh, particles of corn. So we basically clean the material, clean corn, and after that we uh, degerminate the corn to remove the germs part of the corn, which has high oil content. And the the non dijon part is then further grinded to make grits. Now this is used for the extruded snacks manufacturers, like the the purpures and the the snack the extruded snacks. Even uh, for that matter, uh, the cereal flakes, the the breakfast cereals that we use, even that is uh, the raw material for that is corn grits as well. Oh, the Yeah, that. Uh, How do you spell that? that? Spell it, please. It's corn. Grit. Corn grits. It's it's corn c o r n and grits g r i t s grits. Corn grits. Yeah, corn grits, or you can maize grits as well. Okay. How many centers are there in India? Uh, most of the people are working on that, or a few. Well, uh, corn grits in industry basically, uh, if you ask me, ten years back there was not a single industry. Uh, I won't say ten years, but around fifteen years back there was no industry who were manufacturing corn grits. Earlier, corn grits were produced uh, from uh, America or from uh, Spain, in European countries. But in last fifteen years, uh, corn grits manufacturing has developed in India. Uh, I believe there are around 15 to 20 players uh, who are manufacturing corn grits and are exporting to almost 50 countries 
uh, from India. So, uh, any players in MP working? If you know. Uh, can you come again? Uh, what do you mean by SD? In Madhya Pradesh, any player is working for that? Well, uh, we have a, a second unit in Madhya Pradesh. It's in uh, Kukshi, uh, Dhar district. We we have two units. One is in uh, Sangli, Maharashtra, which is uh, uh, boundary of uh, Karnataka. And second unit that we have is in Kukshi, which is again in at the boundary of Maharashtra and Gujarat. It's in MP. Very good, sir. We are near to the Pukshi Indoor is here. So, I think you have uh, visited the Indoor also. Yes, yes, absolutely, sir. Yeah. So, uh, uh, if you want to establish more people or associate more people, then please uh, tell us the details. Your Our WhatsApp number is chat box. So, we can uh, have the more people to be associated with you. And uh, let's uh, work for that to increase the rewards for your uh, uh, products. And similarly, uh, if you are in Kukshi, then you know the in Indore, so many associations and the government is working for the food and all sectors, food sectors, and uh, whatever the planning and uh, they they are making with the uh, safer side for the industrialist and also the company based. Uh, so, uh, Pithampur Associations is there and also AIMP and all CIEI PhD, you, you, you may, uh, you may got uh, so many invitations from that also, or your uh, plant head also, whatever they be. So that uh, on the food sector, we can uh, have so many, uh, we can say opportunities and, uh, you send me what is, what is in your mind. So we have the team and we, we are so many people. Here and uh, in uh, all of the uh, parts of the countries, international, that who wants to work in a food sector, so we, we will do something best. Sure, and, and uh, since we have a good uh, speaker, uh, group of speaker here, uh, there are a few things where uh, in India there is a huge prospects from uh, agricultural point of view, uh, especially when it comes to popcorn maize. Uh, popcorn still in India. Uh, I would say around 80% of popcorn kernels are still imported from either Brazil, Argentina or America. Uh, there is a huge potential of popcorn uh, growing uh, in India. Uh, obviously, the technical aspects, the climatic condition has to be uh, checked. But then uh, recently in India, around uh, in uh, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh near uh, Vijayawada, there is a company who is been growing in, in thousands of acres. And the quality of the popcorn has been very really good. Again, there are uh, huge volumes that is required uh, domestically and in export to men uh, for popcorn. Similarly, there are other uh, corn uh, uh, varieties uh, like uh, waxy corn, uh, which is grown mostly in the Chile, in the Peru area, which is uh, another uh, breed of uh, corn, which is not grown in India. But then uh, there are huge potential where those uh, uh, grains if grown in India of that particular quality there would be another set of uh, uh, parallel uh, snacks could be developed based on the waxy corn so any detail on that matter any feedback for that matter I, I would be very happy to uh, work with any of the uh, dignitaries here welcome sir welcome you send the details we will do something Thank you, Mr. Manoj. There is one question from Mr. Jasper Singh Jing that we would like to Mr. here. What were the challenges you faced with respect to the quality supply of the raw materials? Uh, Kindly info on this, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, quality in India, especially for corn, has been great. Uh, rather, there, I mean, the belt that we come from, which is Sangli, which is in Maharashtra, uh, I know there are clients in Yemen who specifically ask for corn from Sami. So quality wise, yes, there has been uh, uh, quite easily available. Uh, there are, these days there are very knowledgeable farmers who have been uh, going. One of the biggest challenge in India still is the, the contract farming, which is still in a very initial stage. Uh, the contract farming, which basically group of farmers for coming together and, and growing one particular type of seed 
uh, that still is a challenge in India because uh, all the farmers who has either on one acre or five ten acres, they, they grow their own seed, they use their own type of fertilizer. So there, for us, when we buy uh, corn from all these multiple uh, farmers, we still have that challenge of having different varieties even from the same town uh, where the farmers are coming. So that's one place where uh, obviously government knows that factor and they are still working. They are trying to push particular set of fertilizer or seed to a particular area. But then that there has to be more uh, focus on that. If we get consistent quality of corn as a raw material, then we would have easy and better qualities compared to what we have. But having said that, Indian farmers are very smart these days with the technology, the digitization, everybody is aware of when the rains are expected, when, what is the humidity and other things. So a uh, lot of farmers are, uh, rather, there are uh, some examples where uh, there are uh, PhD people who are into the agricultural uh, uh, domain, developing this uh, new crop. Uh, recently in, in, in around Sangli Belt, there is an area which is uh, within the Sangli district. Now which it has, it has stand up in India as one of the biggest producer of baby corn. So even the baby corn is grown in, in, in our area around 50 kilometers from here and it's been exported. So a lot of uh, traction is there from the farmer side to learn. The, the environment is good, but then there has to be more push from the, the contract farming so that we have more consistency in the raw material. Thank you. Thank you, Ji. Thank you, Manoj Zalbadji. It was very nice having you. Thank you for just touching those points and promoting more inclusive and sustainable agro-food GBCs. Thank you so much. It was nice having you and it's a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, moving ahead, like uh, I could see Professor uh, Casey Banyalji joined back again. Mr. Duriraj Kukurangamji also joined back again. We should take up those questions and before we end the session, I think. Yes, coming back to the questions. Sir, you want me to repeat the question for you, sir? Yeah, well, I can um, also read the questions myself yes. because they are there in the chat box. Yeah. So one of the questions from Mr. Jagpal Singh is genetically modified crops are having lots of limitations. Climate change is our major challenges. You know what? In fact, some of the questions are related. True. Sure. So I would like to give a general answer first. And even anyone has specifics, I will come to that. There are certain misconceptions, there are certain myths we carry along with us. You know, that organic farming is good. Yes, it is good. Genetically modified seeds are not good, which is a myth. We have to buy these genetically modified seeds every year. That's not true. It's a myth. Also, I, with regard to this, that you have to buy those seeds every year. I will clarify this first right now. You have to buy the seeds fresh every year if it is a hybrid crop variety. Okay, that hybrid crop variety can be developed through conventional breeding methods, which are being developed, which are there in the market, or can also be developed through GM root, genetically modified root. So, irrespective, whether you use conventional methods or you use genetic modification, if it is a hybrid crop variety, you have to always take seeds fresh every year. And farmers are aware more than what we are talking here today. They are aware of it. And they prefer buying seeds every year because they know if it is a hybrid seed, they get 25% more production. Even if the cost is a little higher than the open pollinated varieties, Farmers are looking for hybrid seeds in one crop or the other. They're not produced in each and every crop. Wherever there's a possibility, they always prefer. And the burning example here in India is BT cotton. It's a hybrid. BT cotton, 95% farmers adopting it for the last 20 years. What are we talking about? 20 years, 95% of the farmers. That's one second. Second, that the organic seeds will disappear. What do we mean by organic seeds? There's nothing called organic crops. These are cultural practices. If you provide dung, you provide, you know, like 
natural fertilizers, not synthetic, not urea, no chemical pesticide, you know, free of all those synthetic agrochemicals. Yes, that's a practice. We prefer this organic farming. But then please remember what we were doing before 1960, when we had in mid 60s green revolution, we were waiting for it. We got those high yielding wheat varieties, rice variety seeds. Farmers planted them. Farmers were advised to give more fertilizers, more agrochemicals, more irrigation to produce more. That was the requirement. But it turns out to be, no, that was not the sustainable way of going. What is the sustainable way? That we cut down on the use of fertilizers, cut down on the use of agrochemicals, particularly pesticides, and still from the same area or land, we produce more. So before the green revolution came, we were not giving more fertilizers. We were not using more agrochemicals. It was all organic, almost. Okay. But then we shifted towards more fertilizers, more irrigation, more chemicals that was required to increase our production. That was the requirement of green revolution. So what are we doing with GM crops, with BT cotton? I mentioned there is a less use of pesticides by the farmers. 22% reduction in the use of pesticides. It's an international analysis, you know, and, and farmers prefer it. And now what we're doing? through genome editing. I must tell you there are certain questions with regards to climate change. There's a wonderful question someone asked, I think, some uh, Dr. Jean Ekonoa. Yes, there are, there are adverse effects of climate change in agriculture. So what are we doing? Now we are trying to, we have learned a lesson through green revolution by damaging the environment, which was important that time to produce more. But now we are working on genome editing where we're trying to increase the efficiency, use efficiency of some of those natural, you know, kind of fertilizers to talk about it, water, land. We're trying to conserve water. Somebody asked me, how can we, you know, have less impact of climate change? We can now reduce greenhouse gas emissions from some of those crops which are developed through genetically modified root or through genome editing. Okay, and also Jennifer Doudna, who is from University of California and USA, one of the Nobel laureates out of the two who were awarded Nobel laureate for genome editing. She's advocating that we should use genome editing in agriculture to improve the crops who have less emission of green and uh, greenhouse gases. It will have less warming, more carbon sequestration to the, to the soil, you know? So there are so many possibilities now. By the way, not that G we always want to do because of our will of scientists, GM crops or genome editing. No, these are the technologies available to supplement the ongoing efforts of conventional crop breeding, which we must do it to increase, you know, the productivity, use less of agrochemicals and, you know, make the agriculture more sustainable from the same area of land. Can we harvest more per unit time? You know, and that's what is happening, actually speaking. That's what we are doing. And also there is a question someone was, I think, asking that we in GM crops bring genes from a foreign source. It's true. Yes, we do bring genes from a foreign source, from bacteria. We have a gene in cotton, you know, but also please remember, we have gene in banana from pepper, green pepper. Banana plant gets dyed, devastated because of a disease called Fusarium wilt. But there is a gene, fortunately, which is available in pepper. You cannot conventionally cross pepper with banana. So what you take, the technology is available. If you want to, nobody is forcing anybody to do anything of this kind. It's a choice with the scientists, with the organizations, with the countries to use it or not to. Or even if it, the products have come to the market, it's choice of the farmers whether to take it or not to take it. But here, what I'm saying here is there's a gene from pepper, which was transferred by an international institution in Africa to crop in, in, in banana, that banana was 100% healthy, no fusarium will disease. So there are so many examples of this kind. Also, there are regulations international level. There's a Cartagena protocol on biosafety. There's a Codex Elementarius with regard to food quality. 
everything is regulated internationally. Very stringent regulations are there when we talk of release of GM crops in any country for that matter. And someone was asking a question, I think I overheard, that you need to do some long-term studies about the safety of some of those genetically modified food crops. The longest study, if you want to call it as a study, is that in the United Nations, people have been eating genetically modified crops for the last 25 years. So I don't know how many people, 450 million or 500 million people eating genetically modified crops. Some of us who go to us to US, you cannot escape genetic modified eating crops. So 450 million people for the last 25 years consuming genetically modified papaya, for example, it's not that it is cooked. It is not that it is processed. It is eaten raw. I have eaten sweet corn genetically modified in US myself. So what I'm saying is, and they're all safe. There's no question at all. There's no sort of allergenic studies. I think Dr. Um, Doria Raj talked very nicely about Brazil not into soybean, but those were the days, initial days gone by. You know, now we're talking whatever is in the market, about dozen of crops, 29 to 30 countries producing it, 72 countries consuming because they're not produced, but they get themselves imported into their country. So they, they, they're happily enjoying the benefits of it. And moreover, important is, this is my appeal to some of my friends who are betting for organic farming. I like myself, who would not like any vegetable or a fruit or a, or a stable crop free of pesticides or agrochemicals or less fertilizers. We all want it. Genetically modified crops are a step towards that only, you know, Someone said you need less pesticide. Yes, there are crops, genetic modified crops where you use less pesticide, much less. I'll give you an example. Give me for two more minutes. I don't know if time is a constraint. I'll give you an example of brinjal in India. I don't know how many of you know brinjal, how many of you have eaten eggplant. Okay. Farmers, poor farmers grow brinjal for their own income, source of income. They have to spray 30 to 40 times in the season of the brinjal crop, 30 to 40 times. Why? And do we accept that crop or the brinjal sprayed with pesticide, loaded with it, and are we happy to eat it? There will be so much of residue, pesticide residue in it. And we are eating it, by the way. Okay, if you're buying the clean looking, nice looking, you know, brinjal, you know, from the market, we're eating it. Okay, while there are regulations to cut down on the pesticidal residue effect, etc. But then BT brinjal was a solution. In BT brinjal, we can kill the insect just by the brinjal when it eats only the leaf portion for it further to develop and get skill. It doesn't even reach to, to the level of fruits where it can bore. It's called fruit borer. It makes a bore, enters the brinjal fruit. And why farmers? end up spraying 40 times because from the larva to that borer, that insect takes the shape, it takes about 24 hours. And once the larva has entered the fruit, it's covered. You keep on spraying pesticide, larva will not get killed. And when, when the 24 hour window, if you can capture within that window, yes, it will be killed. Maybe they're getting killed as well, but farmers will not sitting there watching. They would, we, we don't know, even scientists will not know what is the time period, you know, that the larva will be in a particular field at what stage. So this is only, I would say, the blame on me while I've been advocating myself as a scientist in this country, making people aware about it, that probably we need to make people more aware about it. You know, and my request to Dr. Sri Vidya is to, in fact, you know, you are all United Nations, you're talking everything big, but please, Try to understand, make people aware yes. of any walk of life about these new technologies. Come yes. what may, please remember these technologies use is going to increase further day by day. Why? Population today, 8 billion to 10 billion. Okay, land shrinking, climate having adverse effect. All those challenges, sustainable developmental goals you're talking about 2030. Is just seven, eight years from now, how are you going to meet all this? Until unless 
to supplement the conventional breeding tools which likely people are doing around the world with this gene, gene modification which is so precise accurate and also genome or editing which is further precise and accurate and takes lesser time lesser money lesser resources and give a robust product so these are all scientific driven messages what i have given this is in fact anyone is welcome to talk to me more about it and i would again request dr srividya and all of you those who would take participation in making the whole world aware particularly the indians and the school children thank you very much sorry if i said took more time but i thought i should make it clear and i hope still if there is any question i'm very happy to take those questions sure yeah. there is a request from the participant as well and that's the same request which i have from my side sorry i couldn't hear you can you please uh right on second sir uh, yeah, so, now now i think i'm audible yes there is a request from the participant side so we are going to place one more request we are we are longing to have one more session with you on one to one basis so when can we arrange that let's coordinate and so that we have more things to talk about sure other than the g20 plan yeah plan, we we will we we'll, we'll both of us discuss it out for better sure. dates i give you two three dates any date suits you the best and all others i most welcome and i'm and very happy structure, if you want to have that kind of a working, uh, let's structure your, let, let us structure a working forum as well so that we will be able to as you said it's very important and it is very much objective it is to its rational that we should take it to the common man definitely and exactly. that's what the pro forum is for thank you sir thank you so much yes thank, thank you for the precious time you shared with us today thank you i would like to make only one point here it's not a discussion between dorayraj and professor bansal or something like that i as a student of science i already told that i admire this genetic technology yes. i always Excellent. liked it there's one more question to be added with uh, i think uh, uh, that's for uh, mr dorayraj upren yes. sir your question uh -huh. yeah. india is doing natural organic farming but due to lack of standard information and knowledge farmers are not able to progress yes and more well, over lack of interest of government agricultural officers that's going on negative let's leave the second part of the question but this is what is the thing um like uh, talking about organic farming due to lack of standard information and knowledge farmers are not able to register so right. kindly uh, infer on that sir thank you so much because there are, there are organic standards which specify the uh, the seed has to be like this the chemical fertilizer you no know, the uh, nutrient has to be from plant animal or microbial source only nowhere else and then crop protection also has to be from these three sources only like that there are a lot of standard rules are there farmers are not aware of that so quite a number of training programs have to be conducted and we have to manager there are now clusters being formed fpos are there farmer producer organizations organic clusters are made now or the, these organic clusters are all being trained so if we give enough training they will understand but now there is a lot of confusion in the organic sector also i must bring it out to you there are three verticals in organic farming there is one npop that is national program of organic farming that is one standard uh, that is uh, 2021 2001 it was announced by the government of india we are following it only those people who are certified under npop can export it to other countries so exportable products have to undergo npop certification the next one agriculture department has got one certification system called pgs participatory guarantee system through that system in a village there are about 5 to 10 farmers they can join together form a small cluster and they can tell the local council that we would like to uh, have organic farming okay. and uh, we will inspect ourselves one farmer will go and inspect the other farmer the other farmer will inspect his farm like that self assessment but they will all declare that they will take a oath that we will always form uh, 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 do the organic farming only they will just sign and give it through that they are selling you know that is accepted only for the local markets they can also involve the local traders also to come and inspect their field so that there is no non organic activities taking place so this is one system and the third system recently what has been happening in india is 
the uh, natural farming system. The natural farming system and organic agriculture, there is one important variation. In organic system, we are allowed to use farm resources like cow dung, cow urine, uh, uh, leaf, crop residues, compost, where we compost everything we can use. Plus, we can also supplement it with bio fertilizers made from the laboratories and all that. Bio fertilizers, bio pesticides, we can buy and use it. There are also botanicals like neem extract, neem oil, uh, neem kernel extracts, you know, uh, azadiractin, all those things, uh, if it is organically certified, we can bring it and use it. Those things were allowed in organic farming because crop protection is a major challenge for organic farmers. Organic <coughs> farmers can uh, enrich soil easily, but to protect it from neighboring farmers because 2% farmer may be organic, 98% are non-organic. They are all spraying. Their insects may come and sit in your field. So how are you going to protect it? So there is quite a lot of danger in organic farming. That is why he would like to have some additional protection through bio fertilizers, bio pesticides, neem, and various other purchased in, uh, insecticides. But in today's latest farming technique, that is uh, the natural farming technique, they say that only farm, on farm resources should be used. You should not buy anything from outside. That's good because one way it is sustainable. You will not spend money, zero budget farming, that's what they say. But that is not practical, you know. Even amongst organic farmers, there is a division now. So what is right, you know. Uh, this is kind of confusion happening. So quite a number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this kind of questions will come even amongst farmers. How are we going to do that? What is the right one? They will ask. We have to answer all those things. So there is one more, how are we, sir? Sorry. Uh, so, self first. So first that means whatever we produce let the country use it first means naturally grown for the local consumption yes. but by labeling organic we are ah. deprived of the various foods being available at cost effective because you are labeling it as organic you are depriving the non-organic food is it uh, in the sense like it is not quite available it means it is being exported immediately when you say organic Instead uh -huh. of getting available to the local consumption, to the local market. No, no, that is also available for local consumption. The NPOP certified products are also in big demand by the retail chains in India. Uh -huh. The more uh, uh, Reliance Retail, all these people are buying first. Only the, uh, part of it is doing uh, exported. Export. Not all. But no. of course, all we need to, we need to expand. Definitely, but, we should. Because uh, that's NPOP what the is available for both. Manoj Zalwa. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure having you all. Uh, I, we have come towards the end of the session. Now we open it for the floor for uh, uh, other people to just ask questions or you can register your insights if anybody would like to. Uh, my question with the Doreras. Yes. Is there any special seeds for the increasing yield in the organic farming? No, the, for increasing yield, there is nothing. What we, you know, in organic, no, no. what is it the... should not be treated with the chemicals. That's the only rule they put. It has to be a native seed, you know, anything that can tolerate the local weather and soil, you know, which is adaptable to the local thing. We are trying to avoid diseases. That is our main purpose. To avoid Dr. Venkat Reddy, yeah, sorry if I can come in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Venkat Reddy, you have asked a very good question. And there are no seeds. Yes. You know what you are asking is a question which scientists must answer and those organically favored farmers, they must also know it. You know what? Today, all varieties of any crop which are being developed by crop breeders, they are high yielding varieties. Right? That's why they're breeding them. High, yield, high yielding under optimum conditions of management. What do I mean by that? That you give enough water, you give enough, give enough fertilizers, you give enough agrochemicals, whatever they are required. Because our objective is to produce more. Yeah. Now, 
in the in the seed chain, where will the farmers get those varieties? Which are the varieties in the market? These are the high yielding varieties in the market. And if these varieties are grown by organic farmers and they are being deprived of in the name of organic. No, 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 sir. Less fertilizer. Oh, no, wait a minute. I, I'll come to that. Okay. Or organic manure, which is good. I'm, I'm not against organic farming, I said. But point is, do we have, as Dr. Venkatrati very rightly asked, some varieties which will respond more and will give high yield under those conditions. We don't have. No. Well, we have, but they're less yielding. Before the Green Revolution, before high yielding varieties came into being, we have those, of course, traditional varieties, farmers' no. varieties, but they're not high yielding. That's, no, the that's, uh, that's the answer, Dr. Reddy. Uh, actually, yeah. there is no specific seed, <coughs> high yielding seed for organic. There is only seed for organic, which can prevent diseases and pests, which can tolerate the local weather and the soil condition that's the kind of thing plus it should not be treated with chemical pesticides while thank sowing you. that's on the yeah. thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much it was a wonderful session and definitely uh i think it is it uh, though it was just as it started as a chat session then it went as a brainstorming session as if we were picked up few more pointers which are uh, just not mentioned in the list as well definitely it is a wonderful thing having you all here and uh, it, this platform is more enlightening uh, with all the eminent personalities being present here and we were able to maximize the potential benefits of gvc participation and government needs a mix of dom go domestic and global policy action that's what we concluded for removing all barriers to trade in agro-food products, both tariff and non-tariff barriers, and strengthening the broad uh, investment environmental, enabling agro-food GVCs allow producers to of all sizes to participate and help to ensure greatest gains to the greatest number of participants. And that understanding the drivers of the benefits of GVC participation shows a clear domestic interest of all the countries to remove their own distorting trade and investment policies too as well. So to this end, multilateral efforts that are inclusive of all the countries have to be widely coverage in all the sectors that reaches beyond the agro foods and that is significant potential to deliver to deliver the benefits of all the agricultural producers of this country. So on that note, if this forum would allow, I would like to Hello. share a beautiful video from UAE. That is, we have cultivated a wheat farm over here in UAE just to cherish and just to make your mind green, if you allow me to do so, if the forum allows me to do so. Can I speak for two minutes and we can go ahead? Is it please, okay? Sir, please, uh, that is yeah. from... Uh, that was... Myself, just passing. I would like to speak just two minutes. I like uh, please have your video room. on, sir. Just for sensing. Please have your video on, please. Sure. I'm very yeah, curious to know more about you because you call yourself as a green innovator. Welcome yeah, to the forum absolutely. and the floor is all yours. And your questions were quite insightful, very informative, uh, very inquisitive also. Like we were we were able to learn more and more with all your questions. Thanks for the same. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, myself, just pass him. I'm working in two areas. One is in uh, Maharashtra and the second is in Kerala. I'm uh, presently promoting FPOs in both the regions. Uh, however, we are trying to do it like, you know, in many, uh, we are also interacting with tribal zones also. We all know that farmers are not easy to be cracked. It's the tough part. We can speak theoretically anywhere, but when it comes to practical speaking to them, it's not an easy part. They are quite smarter than us. So the part is from my is like, you know, when we are speaking about agriculture industry, we need to understand that the India is moving towards technology and we need to accept technologies very well. Okay, the first technology that we are moving towards is the drone. When we are speaking about artificial intelligence, surely we need to make sure that each and farm, a farm is able to, you know, get low cost drone services. And let's be focused to this part. You know, the utilization of pesticides, which we are speaking about all about, you know, high level of pest controls are put up. That can be reduced, simply reduced, if you have a proper monitoring of the farmland. Yeah, thank no. you, Jaspal Singh Ji. Please, I have a question. I have an answer for you. This this answer, I'm trying to answer Mr. Jaspal Singh Ji on behalf of everybody who is present here on this forum. 
Thank you so much. That's why I wanted to show this video. This UAE is a desert. It's an absolute desert where it's only sand. It is not even soil. We have done farming here. I just want you all, want everybody to have a look at it. It's a most inspiring video, which will tell us just stop talking, start doing things. That's the message that it conveys. Talk less, work more. With everybody's permission, I would like to share this video, please. We are at a wheat farm in Sharjah, which is preparing to welcome its first harvest. What used to be a desert in Maleha has transformed into a green oasis within months. As you can see, the farm is huge. It covers 400 hectares, which is about the size of 500 football pitches. The first phase of the wheat project was launched in November when Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Muhammad Al Qasimi, the ruler of Sharjah, spread seeds on the soil. The farm is expected to produce up to 1,700 tonnes of wheat in March. Uh, we are expecting the harvesting date to be near uh, uh, 15 to 20 March. The wheat will be going. Uh, to the local market here in Sharjah and UAE. We are not adding chemicals and additives here. We are expecting uh, that the products will be available in market uh, during maybe next uh, May or June. The fields are irrigated using this water reservoir. In a day, up to 60,000 cubic meters are pumped out to the fields using six large suction pumps. The project uses these mechanized sprinkler systems, which can be moved using motors. Three state-of-the-art technologies help to monitor weather and soil conditions. First, sensors are used to measure the quantity of water in the soil to avoid water wastage. Secondly, this on-site weather station predicts temperatures, wind speed and humidity conditions for the next 48 hours. If rain is forecast, the farm cuts down on irrigation to save water. And third, satellite technology is used to monitor the fields and check the state of crops. From seeding to irrigation to harvest, the entire process is automated and mechanized, thereby reducing the dependence on manpower. Currently, the farm operates with the help of just two engineers and six to seven workers. Uh, we face a lot, of, a lot of challenges because uh, uh, most of the elements uh, uh, that's available here um, from actually seeds, uh, from equipment, from agriculture, uh, uh, irrigation systems, it wasn't available in the country. Uh, even the manpower, even the, the expertise. Um, so in three months actually it was uh, a challenging project. Uh, Alhamdulillah we finished it. This is just the first phase of the farm. It will be followed by other phases to reach a total area of 1,900 hectares by 2025. There's also a small experimental farm on site where about 30 varieties of wheat from different countries are grown. The crops are studied, monitored and measured every day by experts. The experiments help in selecting the best variety of wheat for the project. The UAE imports about 1.7 million tons of wheat. The crop's production is an agricultural milestone as the country works on increasing food security amid rising concerns over climate change. This is available in YouTube. I can share the link with you all. So that we can have a look at it once again, definitely. So I will, I will definitely do it, Jaspal Singh Ji. Once again, with due respects to all our dignitaries present here, Professor K. C. Jack Bansal Ji, Mr. Duraraj Kupurangam Ji, and Dr. Venkat Reddy, and Mr. Manoj. So it was so wonderful session. It was really a brainstorming session with the great support of Ms. Apurupa Patnaik and Dr. Vijay Kumar Salveji. Really, it was really wonderful you are having out here. So many insights that we have shared today, which I have learned myself, definitely. And uh, definitely, we should be able to take forward all these suggestions and uh, inferences that we have registered from our site. And we will be publishing it in the form of a journal. And also, we'll be publishing it in the form of a pattern with Dr. Vijay Kumar Salya's support, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody would like to add on there? Definitely, please go ahead. 
we we thank you for organizing this. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sridhar Ji. It's a great informative section, and it's very useful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, Doctor Bhagavan Lal Ji. Adi, thank you. I was very waiting very for your share. It's uh, a usual system that Doctor Bhagavan Lal Ji always be there in our session, uh, and he used to be. थैंक यू थैंक यू यस सर प्लीज गो है चलने वाले डॉक्टर विजय कुमार की विद्या की देवी विद्या मैम और डॉक्टर केसी बंसल केसी केसर कस्तूरी से युक्त केसी बंसल डॉक्टर डोरेराज मन की वेता को बताने वाले डॉक्टर वेंकटेश आयुर्वेद के जानकार और आयुर्वेद के वैज्ञानिक डॉक्टर मनोज जैनकर और जसपाल जी जसपाल जी ने तो पूरा मन की व्यथा ही खोल दी जर्नलिस्ट एंड इनोवेटर तो मैं इसके बारे में एक रामधारी सिंह जी ने एक बात बताई थी आ, उनके समय की बात है सोनो को मिलता है दूध वस्त्र सोनो को मिलता है दूध वस्त्र भूखे बालक अकुलाते भूखे बालक अकुलाते माँ की हड्डी से चिपक चिपक कर झाड़ो की रात बिताते झाड़ो की रात बिताते अर्थ इसका यह है कि हिंदुस्तान उस समय की गरीबी के बारे में उन्होंने वर्णन किया है कि हिंदुस्तान ऐसा देश है कि यहाँ के कुत्तों को भी दूध वस्त्र प्राप्त होता है मगर जो पहाड़ों में रहने वाली जाती है जो दलित गरीब जाती है वो जाति मतलब उनके वस्त्र न होने के कारण बच्चे माँ की हड्डी से चिपक चिपक कर पूरी सर्दियों की रात बिताते हैं तो उसके बाद में तो काफी डेवलप हो चुका है हो चुका है और डेवलपिंग की कोई कमी नहीं रही अब वो भारत में ही रहा जब कोई यहाँ पर कोई भूखा मर जाता था मगर अब भूखे की कोई ऐसी नौबत है नहीं है सरकार हर तरीके की सहायता कर रही है मगर तो भी मैं एक ये निराकार संसार के बारे में बता देता हूँ क्या मन मा क्या मन क्या तन मान तारे एक दिन माटी में मिल जाना क्या तन मान तारे एक दिन माटी में मिल जाना माटी में मिल जाना प्यारे माटी में मिल जाना प्यारे जहे सीता पर सो जाना जहे सीता पर सो जाना क्या तन मांझ तारे एक दिन मिल जाना माटी में मिल जाना कहने का मतलब यह है मैडम साहिबान कि संसार निराकार है ये तन जो बनता है जो किसान बेचारा कृषि करता है है अपना जितना भी तन मान और पसीना बहाता है और पसीना बहाने के बाद में अपन को वो भोजन की उपलब्धि करवाता है वो अपन खुद भूखा रह जाता है मगर अपन को वो भोजन कराता है तो वो किसान की व्यथा और वो आज भोजन भोजन में क्या क्या निकल गए हैं कई पॉपकॉर्न निकाल दिए कई प्लास्टिक में उसको फिट कर दिया भोजन को तो वो भोजन हम खाते हैं शुद्ध और सात्विकता वो मैडम कहाँ रही जो कभी पुराने जमानों में उगा करती थे घट्टी की पिसाई का वो आटा वो आज भी याद आता है मगर वो क्या करे करे कर क्या ये जैसे अभी अभी बायोटेक्नोलॉजी वालों ने काफी बता दिया जितने भी जो वैज्ञानिक थे यहाँ जितने भी कृषि के क्षेत्र में भोजन के क्षेत्र में न जाने क्या क्या इतना बता दिया इतना बता दिया इतने शोध बता दिए इतने आविष्कार बता दिए और आविष्कार न जाने कहा ये उड़ते जा रहे हैं उड़ते जा रहे हैं फिर भी मेरा भारत महान है we need to upgrade ourselves we need to see the change we need to find the change we need to look for the change we need to change for being sustainable sustainable, sustainable starts from charity begins at home we need to become ourselves the change begins in ourselves from us and then we can just take it to the society we can take it to the community that's what i want okay. to register thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you all it is a wonderful it
is the greatest pleasure meeting you all on this platform. I look forward to meet you all once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do respects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aparupa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ji. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you, Manoj Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.